All right, let's kick it off. Hello and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our inaugural AI and tech conference. Very exciting times in the sector, as you all know. My name is Sean Severson, CEO and co-founder of Water Tower Research. Uh, I want to thank everybody for attending today. As a reminder, this is a uh, hybrid day today, so we're obviously here live in person. And also to all the audience that is, uh, that is viewing this online today. As remember, they'll also be available on demand. And tomorrow we'll have it on our, uh, our virtual continuation of this conference and with a full slate. So again, thank you everyone for attending companies and investors. As a reminder, our role here is to connect investors and companies. Uh, we use that in a research driven process using our, our star analysts, which I'll introduce here momentarily uh, as the centerpieces for how we reach investors and, and uh, help companies engage with investors. So again, thank you everyone for joining us. I'm going to give a quick intro to um, to our analysts. So if you want to step up first, uh, Curtis or John, whoever goes first, you guys pick. <laughs> Thank you. That's a quick intro. Oops, go out this way. Yep. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, this is Curtis Schager. I'm the analyst here at, uh, at Water Tower Covering Technology, just, uh, you know, just new to the firm over the last seven, eight months. Uh, so just getting rolling. Uh, it's great to be aboard and, and working with everybody else and finally getting to see everybody else in person and being back in New York first time in 13, 14 years. So Anyways, uh, hopefully get to meet more of you throughout the day. Thanks. John? Hi, everybody. I'm John Roy. Uh, just to give you a little bit of my background so you kind of know where I'm coming from. Really a trained engineer, a couple double E degrees, PhDs in computer science. Uh, spent a number of years on Wall Street doing tech, then went to equity research. Actually worked, walked, worked in the building right over there for six years doing a IBM, Apple, and all those guys in terms of research, and I switched to Hamburg, and then went to another place, and then ended up at UBS. And when Sean talked to me, he says, you know, you can live anywhere you want. I'm like, great. I, I'm ready. I'm now in Florida. So, But I, I like Curtis saying, great to be here. Great to see all you all. And great to see you all virtually as well, everybody out there. And uh, great to meet you, and we'll really enjoy the day. Thank you. Thanks, John. Yeah, same thing. I just wanted to remind everybody as well that, uh, you know, please reach out to any of our team members as an investor if you're interested in meeting with the, any of the companies today or follow-ups on this to please reach out to our investor engagement team. Uh, we will be following up with uh, most of you as well in their attendance and, and uh, through uh, virtually. But again, as a reminder, uh, we do have an open access platform. Our research is, uh, is MIFID II compliant. We're in all the research aggregators. You can find our research there, as well as our website at www.watertarresearch.com. And again, I encourage you to reach out to our team uh, if you have uh, any additional questions or would like to meet with any of the companies, we definitely encourage that. So with that, I guess we're gonna turn it over and start uh, with the first, uh, first company. And Curtis, I believe you're given the, the introduction and thank you everyone. It's me again uh, with the first introduction here to get us going. Uh, it will be Yochi Ochi. Ochi. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry. Sorry. I was trying to get that before I started. Uh, the CEO and director of Pixie Dust Technologies, in, uh, which trades on NASDAQ under the symbol PX, PXDT. As a reminder uh, to uh, everybody attending, uh, immediately following presentation by Pixie Dust, uh, the company management will be in the front conference room, the one with the lovely view, uh, for a breakout session if you'd like to meet with them. Uh, if you would like to schedule one-on-one -on -one with them, just please let us know at the desk. And with that, Pixie Dust Technologies. So, hello everyone. So, we'd like to introduce our Pixie Dust company. And so we are Pixie Dust Technologies and are located in Japan. And also we, our headquarters in Tokyo. And also we have a research laboratory in the Tsukuba. Tsukuba is northern part of the Tokyo, that is Kanto prefectures. And also that we have 85 employees and we established our company in 2017. Then my background is uh, like working for the computer science for the almost uh, from the PhD degree, I think the 15 years. So I, I got a PhD of the computer science at the University of Tokyo. Uh, especially I'm working on the holograms. It means like optimizations of the wave 
quantities such as like a acoustic waves or radioactive waves or like light field or this kind of topic is my like working for a long time. Then we established the Pixie Dust Technologies. Actually, we started with my colleague Takayuki Hoshi, and we are the uh, almost uh, founders of the like uh, ultrasonic phase dilates technologies such like uh, using in industries to render the aerial haptics or acoustic levitations or like this kind of the wave optimization is our one of the specialties in my company. Then we started Pixida, so like we founded in 2017. After that, we do the like research as a service. We collaborated with many Japanese companies such as like a car industry, automobile industry, or medical industry to working for the how to use the wave field such as like ultrasonic waves or light field or making new metal materials or new system with uh, optimizations for uh, to catch up the words or making subscriptions or these kind of things we're working on. Then we uh, um, did the Series A and the Series B and also Series C. Then we listed on the NASDAQ last year at August. Then uh, several uh, uh, our uh, implementations or products are already available in the uh, market in Japan. And also, we are now looking forward to make it right uh, globally, like uh, to make it a strategy to like our metamaterials technologies or uh, healthcare technology using the these kind of the wave field quantities, such as like, modulations or optimizations. So actually, like a uh, current like six years, we uh, five years we found, founded our company after that. So actually, we doing the to facing our local problem in Japan because of the, our customers mainly uh, local Japanese companies such as like, medical companies. Well, however, the, the uh, they export the, these kind of medicals or cards or these kind of topics to the globally. But uh, actually, we are we are making the B two B service in Japan. So because of that, actually we are focusing on more the social environment that and also the social problems in Japan, such as like, uh, aging problems or elderly persons, or make it more smooth communication between the elderly and also young persons, such as like, uh, using the AI to analyze what kind of they say, or like uh, making the new items, such as like, uh, making it aut automatically make it sound to the words or voice to the text to like, uh, make it more smooth communications. So uh, so at first, actually, what, what is a wave field? Actually, like. Uh, I'm doing the long time for the computer science and also the like using the ultrasound or sound light or radio waves. Uh, that's really my like uh, home field. But uh, it, I think that is uh, like so uh, a little bit strange for you. But uh, uh, everything like uh, uh, wave quantities in the computers like uh, easily to like combat inside the data. It means like uh, if you find the sine waves of the sound. Or if you find like all the sound waves with the sound waves, that is the difference is a uh, wavelengths or like that the quantities which transfer. It means like a uh, physical quantities in oh, if for sound that is for the air vibrations. But uh, if we use uh, light waves, in that case we use electromagnetic waves in on the like light mediums. That is uh, like a difference in the physical quantities. But uh, it is almost the same if you make it transfer in data. So in that case, we use the optimizations are uh, almost the same process using the sound or light field or radio waves. Because of that, our co core technology is working on the how to make it computationally access and optimizations on the light wave field technologies. So we have a, like a several like a, uh, core technology for the modulations or like a beam forming or a simulation in the computer computer science. It means like uh, using a speaker arrays or microphone arrays or making the transform into the like a more like a physical simulations that is uh, making new acoustic chambers or making a new mat metamaterials. So please imagine that also, also the uh, metamaterials often used in the uh, in the submarines or make it like uh, aircraft to reducing the laser ref uh, radar reflections. Or, uh, however, we use it more like uh, in the workspace, not to military, not to military use, but uh, we uh, using the uh, metamaterials for the workspace or like uh, medic medical care or these kind of things we do did uh, current six years. And also we did uh, healthcare, healthcare areas or material areas or sensing areas. We uh, optimize this uh, wave control technology into that field. So let me do the, some demos or let me introduce our product several way. And also 
uh, at first I said uh, we provide the research as a service for the uh, many B2B company. And uh, so first six years we working on, and then we have a collaborators such as uh, many medical companies or healthcare company. Because of that, after that, we uh, make it like a commercialize or make it into the market, these kind of the products in inside. Then firstly, I'd like to show the, this one, Sonori Pro. So I think the, the guys in this room, you can see, and uh, that is uh, like one of the healthcare, uh, scalp care device. So actually, uh, fortunately, I find uh, our team find it uh, these kind of ultrasonic stimulations into the scalp can be make it like a, a hair hair growth in our mice experiment. Then after that, we started to like uh, make it commercialize that product into the market. And also, that is interestingly like uh, ultrasonic care is using for the broken bones, uh, already using for the broken bones. Actually, if you broken bones on your arms, like you use, use the ultrasound to recover faster. And however, the other way, such as like onto the skins, onto the surface of the like uh, our face, or these kind of things have not been explored so much. So because of that, we started this research over five years ago. Then we had to make it as a, like a medical care device for the hair. Then uh, we uh, doing the research and also that we you can buy the market in Japan. However, we uh, decide to like make it more globally, like such like a US or Europe, or we make it like a deployment for that. And then second, I would we direct to show uh, see show the center center product that is a Kikipa, uh, that is a gamma wave uh, sound care health uh, device. So it is uh, like a TV speakers. However. We collaborated a long time for the Shionogi. Shionogi is a medic leading medical company in Japan. And also that is a gamma, uh, that is a sound stimulations for the human brains. And also the making the gamma waves to like uh, invoked. The actually like a gamma waves invoking or gamma, uh, stimulation for the gamma wave is really important for like a uh, to uh, health care for the brain. And also, actually, several research is now uh, everything uh, doing for like uh, how to make it prevent the dementia uh, to invoking the gamma waves. And also, we actually like uh, tackled this problem for a long time. So how to make it invoke the gamma waves and also the, how to be connected with the uh, brain care uh, using not medical approach, but using the sound wave approach. I think that is not so not so much so, uh, side effect, but. Uh, we can make it boost like a, such like a stimulation with a sound or stimulation from the light waves or sound waves can be uh, boost and overlapped between the medical approach together. So because of that, our like uh, collaborators such as like Shionogi or Anfa for the healthcare, and uh, that is uh, wanted to be make it the new device that is collaborated with uh, like sound wave technologies. And the third things we like to show uh, is uh, our beam forming technology that in microphone. Oh. Oh, is it okay? Okay. Uh, he's a uh, our company CFO Tarumi san, and uh, he's uh, supporting me for the like uh, demonstrations. And uh, he is uh, here. This sound is a modulated sound from the speakers. Unfortunately, we don't bring the speaker itself. However, this sound is uh, computationally designed to invoke the gamma wave sound from the special modulations by com by combating the real time. Is it okay? Yep. And. Uh, also, we uh, in, uh, introduced it to the nursing homes, the hospital in many local in Japan, and also that is be used with uh, televisions. So please imagine that your grandma or grandpa are seeing that televisions and also uh, placing the uh, special sound speakers, and that is real time we combat it to the sound into their ear stimulations and making the gamma waves. And also, uh, this one is uh, one of the uh, microphone device. Actually, I say that like a wave field or wave quantities can be handled into computer science. It will be transferred easily, like input to the output. In that case, actually, this is a beamforming microphone array. So uh, we show the uh, like a uh, scalp care device as uh, many speakers at the same time, but uh, here is many microphones at the same time. Because of that, it can be uh, real timely it, uh, understand what uh, sound coming from and also what I'm going to. Then uh, no, now it is a uh, real time uh, subscribe, uh, real time making the te voice to take is there, and actually this kind of the use case is for like uh, use for the like uh, how to help the elderly person who, who cannot hear sound or how to help the communication between the like uh, uh, language barriers. So often we use this one, and uh, also uh, finally I direct a uh, translation. Okay. 
Can you say something in Japanese? どうぞ Is it working? Hi, can you hear me? 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 Where can I feel? Oh, oh, oh. oh. I think that will be demo in the like a、uh, Q&A sessions. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 It will be work. Then, and also, ah,、uh, Uh, I'd like to show the, some meta materials. And also, this is、uh, like passive materials. We show the, some active materials for what、uh, actually active means、uh, using the microphones or speakers. That is with electricity. But、uh, here is、uh, Iwasemi. We call this product as、uh, sound meta materials. So actually, we have a project for the sound absorption meta materials or sound insulation meta materials. It means like a Transfer,、uh, or transform the like, material properties by、uh, optimizations of each chambers. And also, we set it in the like,、uh, conference rooms or like, meeting rooms in the office and also put it as a、like, uh, sound absorber. Because of the, you, I think the, you have like, experienced that, like, a bad experience in that like,、uh, video talk or conferencing in a glass cupboard、uh, conference room or meeting room because that echo is so much. Uh, because of the glass cannot、uh, absorb the sound, it will be directly reflected in the surface. However, like,、uh, make it the transparent、uh, materials and also the make it computations uh, to uh, build the like,、uh, inner chambers to, and also adjust the frequency to absorb and by reflections. So we、uh, build the several acoustic chamber inside and also put it as a meta materials. So actually, we're working on this kind of the Uh, meta materials、uh, science and also the topic for the like,、uh, end users. Then、uh, we provide it into the market. And also, the, we have、uh, this kind of the series of the meta materials. Actually, we are still working on so long time. And also, this one is one demo. So, Tarmi san will do the next sound insulation materials that can be.、Uh, Insulation of the sound came from the speakers, and also the, the, he will firstly、uh, insert it in normal tubes, but the, after that, he will insert tubes, especially optimized tubes. So, can you hear? I think 40% of the sound emissions will be、uh, transferred into that demo. And then, actually, like a. Yeah, and at the back side, that is almost normal. Is it okay? Oh. Yeah, oh, 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 oh. Are you okay? Ah, okay, that is simple. Okay. Nice. Then,、uh, actually, our business model is working for the, like, a firstly, we do with a, uh, provide a research as a service and also the pri-、uh, provide a collaboration research with uh, uh, such like a medical companies or like many companies、uh, in Japan.、Uh, fast, firstly, then after that, we like,、uh, started uh, like, uh, different like,、uh, social awareness activities. So, because of the, each like, our product is really、uh, quite a new product. And also, the make it new principle. And、uh, actually, like,、uh, as a new、uh, novelty in the research, and、uh, together as a product that is novelty. And also, this kind of the,、uh, quite new product and also the quite new market. I think that is quite hard for the every time. But、uh, actually, that is like、uh, our motivation to make it like a, a new market and also the new research field at the same time. And also, we collaborated with uh, many uh, companies in Japan and working for the, especially we, our core technology is working for the sound or light field or this kind of the wave quantities. But so we、uh, collaborated such like,、uh, in this case, actually, we're working for the gamma waves stimulations or how to make it a d i m e n s i a product with a, like, a non medical approach, actually, using the other like,、uh, physical quantities. Then, 
this kind of the business model is really quite unique because of the like a, a provider research and making the research field and uh, making making the social awareness and also the making the product into the market and also the making the collaborations or uh, making the product into the society such like uh, using that sound into nursing homes or using that sound device into the like uh, like your shopping centers or shopping malls or everywhere in, like uh, as a social pro as a so to solve the social problems. So, uh, because of that, this kind of the approach, actually, we are focusing on the how to like uh, uh, how to like uh, assume or so how to get the patent or like uh, how to make it uh, like the uh, registrations, and also we deeply make it like uh, clarify uh, this kind of the nobility of the each product, and also actually, uh, fortunately, we got the many awards from the CES or like uh, in uh, like a Japanese national awards or these kind of things. Then. After the we IPO Nasdaq, we are focusing on how to make it like commercialized in the other areas in, in globally. And because of the our material itself, because of, and the product itself is not so much language oriented because of the that is like a looks designed materials or health scales or Medicare materials. Because of that, actually, we are focusing on how to make it like a globally or provided that is new product. And then uh, actually, you have uh, already have a financial result in the, as a presentation materials and also we are still working on the not so much at the break even point but uh, we are still working to like uh, make it like a uh, 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 nice growth late or every time and also we are marking for the how to uh, set the next breaking very quick even point and also that we are still looking for the investors to uh, get along with our deep tech technologies so uh, we have a uh, several R and D pipeline. After that, actually, uh, we show the uh, like healthcare with uh, acoustic waves, and however, that will be like uh, transferred into the other areas, such like uh, beauty care or skin disease treatment or wound treatment. And actually, we started with our this kind of the ultrasonic uh, stimulation research for the wound treatment. Well, at first, we started mice and the mice packs and make it wound, and also the uh, place the uh, uh, ultrasonic waves into that uh, skin. Uh, however, we found it uh, firstly to hair growth. Oh, uh, we really surprised about that because of the first we see uh, thought that the wound treatment will be faster because of the, the ultrasonic using the wound treatment for the broken bones already. But uh, like uh, uh, ultrasonic waves from the air to the skin, that is uh, interestingly, uh, uh, hair growth is more faster than wound treatment. So because of that, we started that product, product into the market. Then actually, this kind of the research is still working on our, our collaboration with the medical university. And also, that is both ways to get the PDA, uh, PDMA approval or FDA approval and also to make it materials. Actually, sound speakers itself is not so much risk for the humans. Uh, because of the that is not medical drugs, but uh, that can be uh, used uh, uh, both enhancement for the medical things and the stimulation things that together. And because of that, actually, actually that is the important things. And also uh, because of that, we uh, make it product fast and also the keep going on doing the FDA or PDMA approval for each regions. And also we are talking with uh, uh, to make it approval uh, for. Uh, make advertisement or for the like uh, insist our result of the each uh, functions and we are still working on writing the papers or academic results for each product itself and uh, so so the like a scalp care or ultrasonic stimulation is uh, working on the, this one and also the gamma waves sound care that is modulation speakers and also dementia care by sound we are working for the like a long time for the collaboration research with uh, medical university and also the uh, medical companies and also uh, gamma wave sound care uh, is now product is delivered but uh, we are now still working on how to make it uh, with a uh, pdma or FDA, fda approvals in each regions and also uh, we are working on the such like meta material technologies. Actually, we show that uh, sound absorbing materials. So uh, now we deliver it in the market. Like you can buy the Amazon's or you can buy the. And you can see uh, actually in, in Japan, many offices have uh, like this type of meta materials. But uh, we are now working for the like how to sound insulation materials for the factories or more B two B use or construction areas or like. Uh, 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 high-speed trains or uh, this kind of way is really conducted in our research for now and also we make it 
other business deployment and also development at, uh, together. Then this kind of a sensing approach or uh, uh, approach for the uh, doing new product. Actually, like uh, many pipelines we exist, and also the, if you are interested in this kind of the, like how to make it uh, construction areas or how to make it workforce or how to make it like a uh, uh, workspace areas. So if you please. Um, pick me up and also talking about uh, like uh, uh, next applications or next investment to research. So finally, uh, we have a uh, like uh, we uh, time to close the presentation. So we have a uh, web uh, web control technologies such like three areas we show. One is a healthcare, and the second is the materials, and the third is sensing for the like microphones or beam forming mic, and also using the metamaterials to absorb the sound or using the sound technology to like a health cares or uh, like a brain cares. And uh, so this kind of technology looks like a large portfolio, but uh, based on the wave control technologies, optimizations or calculations of the wave quantities. So we have uh, like uh, 40, 40 engineers in our, uh, our companies and also 10, almost uh, 10 researchers working uh, every time for the like uh, doing the academic research and also the industrial research at the same time and uh, to new, make it new, new product. So we show the several products. So thank you so much for uh, uh, using us, and also the thank you so much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, at this time, I'm going to open up the floor for some Q and A. Yep. Yes. All right, Sean. Hold on one second. I would ask everyone to wait for the microphone to get to you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I was curious about how you're going to market with your consumer products. Is that B to is that B to C direct? Is that how you're selling or using ch other channels to uh, to accomplish that? Mm -hmm. Actually, at the same time, like uh, making the channels and also the uh, because of the firstly, uh, as a research as a service, we have a collaborators. Uh, it means like uh, for the medical use, we started with a medical company. Uh, because of that, they have already channels uh, for the that pain point or users need. Then after that, we uh, release our uh, product and the materials on that use. And also that will be revenue share or like uh, uh, we ha have, uh, we uh, only have uh, 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 so sales channels. And actually both cases will happen. That is why the like, sales channels uh, provided by the, our customer company as a research as a service. After that, we make it product or like make it a new product based on that principle. In that case, we have our own uh, sales channel to that, yeah, all together. But the uh, uh, important thing is how to make it a, a, a social education or social like uh, uh, interest for like uh, that new technologies or new care or new way. So that is uh, continuously uh, we did this kind of the approach. So that is a good question. Thank you so much. All right, next question. Thank you. Have you um, looked into integrating your technology within existing speaker companies like Bose and Sensheimer and all those guys yep. uh, to get to, to reach a broader, yep. more mass market? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think that will be like a, a needed to real time conversions for the special chips or special semiconductors needed. For However, the, that can be easy to like connect such like a, a special modules and that is connected to the, just like a speaker cables and inside. So I, that will be available. And also we will do, uh, actually we are plan to make it uh, these kind of collaborations for the mass speakers. However, at first, actually, we make it like a special design for the like our signature product. So that is like a consumer available, and also that is signature for the oh, this is a like gamma wave treatment speakers or these kind of things. After that, we now we are licensing the, like this kind of the how to modulate sound itself in the like a shopping malls or many like a nursing home or these kind of things we're working on. Yeah, that is a good question. Thank you so much. Anyone else from the audience? I know we, oh, here we go. As far as um, uh, the technology, is it patent protected? Do you have yes. process patents or? Actually, uh, we mainly patented for the, uh, actually we may patented many technologies of the like uh, shapes and also modulation way and also the like a uh, uh, circuit board and also the software. But the important thing is uh, like a uh, uh, production, pro uh, several way to preserve the patent. Actually like a uh, patent itself is like a uh, key for the like uh, many countries. However, like uh, if it copy in the, like a uh, factory in the Asian countries or many situations, uh, in that case, we need to like uh, more preserve the algorithms or 
preserve the like a way of the manufacturing. So these things is important to like preserve our like uh, new technologies. So that is a good question. That's why because of the, our company is founded almost uh, five years. However, the patent uh, uh, submissions is almost 200, over 200 or actually many patented uh, technology we have. Yeah. Yes. I have a question on the meta metal. Yes. That you talked about. Basically, uh, if I was understanding correctly, it's yep. used to be a sound dampener. Um, so when I look at that and I contrast that against things like foam panels and mm -hmm. people putting carpet over boards and mounting that on the wall, yes. um, your option is more aesthetically attractive. Yep. But from a, from a price standpoint, yep. I mean, it, I would think that it's hard to compete against a piece of foam mm -hmm. that you that you're able to, to put against walls like how does uh how does your product on the meta metal perform not only acoustically as a sound dampener but yes. also from a pricing standpoint yeah. what's kind of the the delta between yeah, your main a, competition that is good questions and uh, so actually my background is acoustics and also computer science so because of the, we our laboratory have uh, all, all uh, is acoustic chambers or uh, no reflection rooms and in that case, they use uh, more different materials, such as like, uh, uh, rubbers or uh, like uh, forms uh, shaped like uh, cones or kind of things uh, often you see. Uh, however, uh, the uh, uh, availability of the materials, because of our background in computer science, uh, specially um, uh, designed chamber, uh, that is uh, not a damper, but a chamber, acoustic chamber in the reflections. So, yeah, this is kind of the way to like uh, choose the material and also the design the special de shape into that market. And also, always we have, uh, well, not always, but uh, uh, first, at, all, all time at first, we have a collaborators, such as like, uh, we want to make it uh, meta materials, like a transparent materials, or this kind of the functionality will be needed uh, by our customers. Then we uh, specially designed or specially calculation by our al algorithms. And uh, making the like uh, cost efficient in the production process because of the, if we use a three D printer that is not cost so much uh, that is cost so much so that we cannot decide so because of that like uh, firstly we uh, designed the special chambers or some like uh, 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 acoustic meta materials then after that we uh, doing the research on the how to make it uh, in the factory so much lower price. Then the process itself, so that like a quite make it lower price in the uh, ordinary production process, and also make it like a computational analysis. Our strong that is our strong point, and uh, so uh, because of that, actually we are working on. However, uh, you see, it's about uh, we uh, about doing about aesthetics or design approach. So I think that is correct because of the uh, to choose. Uh, any kind of the material into the acoustic into the acoustic metal materials that is important because of the user want to choose uh, materials such as like, uh, we want to wood metal materials or we want to make it like a plastic metal materials or we want to make the transparent or lightweight or like uh, any kind of the materials we need they need to calculate or make it uh, optimizations so because of that actually we started for the b2b uh, to provide our design to the our customers and then after that we started to sort it turned it to the b2b b2c market possibly often the b2b yeah all right we're almost at our end but we have time for one more question on the gamma wave technology have you yes. done any clinical trials on on that technology yeah actually we do the clinical trial and also uh, both sides, uh, because of the cl clinical trial for the medical approach is uh, like a needed to long time uh, experiment. And also uh, behavior research, such like a place eat nursing home and what happened to more uh, social problem happened in the nursing home, or this kind of the known like a uh, drug delivery research, and that is can be more easy to do. And also uh, to do the like a more uh, human uh, uh, conducted research our uh, it means a user study, such like uh, doing praise uh, these speakers and just uh, capture the uh, EEG or gamma waves. And that is more easier. That is uh, like a correlation uh, uh, our speaker emissions and also gamma wave happened in the brain. That it will be more easier. Then these three steps, one is a more like a medically uh, strict and also the uh, medically correct approach. And also the second is a, a more social user study. And the third is a just stimulation and user study. This three study we're still working on. And, and second, uh, first one, 
uh, place a sound and come up with invoking. And that is like uh, we published the paper still, still, uh, already. And uh, however, uh, this uh, two, second uh, two approach, more so social approach and also the medical approach, we are still working on. However, we uh, already uh, released the product to the market because of that is not no risk for the humans. Actually, because of just speakers. So not for the medical approach, uh, because of the, if you deliver the drug, that is so much dangerous. But uh, it is, uh, I think, I believe it is really uh, in the, our uh, research with mice and also that approach, uh, uh, will, uh, it is have a effect to the like, uh, gamma wave care. But uh, like, uh, we are still uh, social experience working on. Yeah. Yoichi, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you so much. To our virtual audience, we'll get started here Thank in just you. a couple minutes. Uh, to our in-person audience, as a reminder, you do have some opportunity to learn some more. You're welcome to go into the front conference room yep. where uh, Pixie Dust will be sitting for the next couple, uh, 30 minutes, and then there are opportunities to meet with them one-on-one -on -one throughout the day. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, hello, our next presentation will be from Dave Greenfield, Chief Product Officer at Sova, a private company. As a reminder to the person in people in attendance, immediately following the presentation, management will be in the front conference room for a breakout session if you would like to meet with them there. If you would like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one meeting with them, please see the Water Tower desk. Welcome, David. Thank you. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about what we call avoiding your blockbuster moment and how to navigate the challenging dynamic environment with AI to make sure you have a, a winning strategy. So I think like most of you, dating myself a little bit as the former younger, young tech guy in the room, I guess, again, getting a little bit up in age, but still remember you know, the days when a Friday night was blockbuster night, right? So part of our family ritual and the ritual of many other families was 
going to the local blockbuster, browsing all of the latest releases, seeing what movies were out there, and hoping that they had whatever game or movie we were thinking about in stock. At the peak, Blockbuster had over 9,000 global locations and around six billion in, in revenue, uh, but things were quickly changing. So with the advent of the internet, you know, part of the movie discovery experience that I described was being replaced by online search. So around 1998, a company called Rotten Tomatoes came out, introduced online movie reviews and provided both a searchable database of movies that were coming to theaters, to DVD, uh, as well as ratings from both consumers and critics. So started to change the experience of how people were consuming movies and, and TV. And by 2010, uh, Blockbuster was in a tailspin. Things had changed dramatically and seemingly overnight. So stores everywhere were closing. I think they were down to about 1,000 stores at that point and had just entered uh, Chapter 11 to try to restructure their business in order to be successful and try to, try to re revitalize, which Ultimately, didn't work as I think today. There's still one blockbuster in Bend, Oregon, but it's serving more as a kind of museum in remembrance. And there's actually a few, few fun Netflix videos that uh, document the the trip, which is a great case of irony as well. Um, so what was happening? So I think over the same time period, the emergence of online video com companies were were coming to fruition. And so I think this chart starts it shows a lot about revenue, but it's more about the story. So. You look at the beginning, Netflix started as a DVD by mail service, but they always had the vision and the market vision that consumers would move to streaming at some point. And so their strategy and their performance really mirrors that. So you can see during the period of 2007 to 2011 or so in there, they had kind of a hybrid bundled model. So they worked incrementally towards that technology, but then even then rolled it out to consumers as consumers are ready. It wasn't until 2012 when that kind of took off and they split the DVD and uh, DVD by mail and, and streaming businesses into separate offerings for consumers. And you can see the rest of this history from there as that kind of took off. And the TV experience we know and love and somewhat hate when there's 12 streaming services, if you have that like idea that you have to search through. <laughs> and it came to fruition and started to dominate and really eliminated the in-person video stores. So what are the key takeaways? Um, so Netflix had you know, vision long before the technology was ready. And it's kind of hard to imagine now, but at the time, you know, people and technology were not ready to ad adopt streaming video. So streaming meant that, you know, you were likely using a laptop or home computer. The resolution was lower and worse than DVD. Um, you know, it was often choppy. Sometimes you'd have minute long pauses in, in your viewing experience. So it was, it was, there's a lot of barriers to streaming becoming the dominant way that people consume content. So it was you know, somewhat visionary and somewhat uh, research driven that they were able to pursue that route. And it was smart of them to kind of look forward over time and build you know, kind of incremental roadmap that worked towards that vision rather than say, okay, we're gonna go all in, abandon the DVD version, assuming they had, as, as soon as they had streaming available. Alternatively, like Blockbuster, they weren't asleep at the wheel. We've got a couple of fun, uh, fun diagrams we broke out of old Blockbuster 10Ks and, and financial statements. So they weren't completely unaware of the online transition, but they really didn't have the conviction and the future vision that uh, Netflix had. And they kind of only started to pay attention to the trends uh, you know, kind of at the point where it was too late when consumers were starting to switch uh, kind of how they consumed content, both both the subscription model and then eventually to, to streaming. Uh, and at that point, it's difficult, and they had to, they're kind of forced into a very reactive strategy. So why are we talking about Blockbuster at an AI conference? Give me a second, get a sip of water. So hopefully, I guess the point's obvious to most of you folks. Um, you know, we see AI causing this type of disruption across most industries today. Um, and really, like, the proof is in the results. So a couple stats, I think this is from an IDC survey last year. Um, so for companies who are investing in AI, they're typically seeing around a 3.5x return. Um, and the top tier of companies, the top 5%, realizing almost an 800% return on their investments. And uh, just as importantly, the deployments are quick. Right? So a lot of the technology is available out of the box, and deployments are taking kind of less months to go from start to finish, um, and about 14 months to go to a point where you kind of repay your in initial capital. Uh, and I think more importantly than this, it's not just that people are kind of saving money, they're providing better experiences and providing experiences and products and workflows that people can't imagine going back to the way things were before. I think that that's always a piece that I think about when I think about Blockbuster and Netflix and that transition. It's like, 
hard to imagine going back to having to go to a store, you know, <laughs> to, to look and find content and, and see what's out there now. So I think that's kind of one of the key ingredients. So we'll look at a couple kind of case examples. So some of you may have heard of Klarna. They made uh, headlines last year kind of with their AI story. Um, and so Klarna, if you're not familiar with them, they're kind of a, a global buy now, pay later provider. So they're a platform that's integrated with over 50,000 different vendors to provide you know, financing at the point of transaction for consumer products. Um, and so last year they switched their customer service, which as you can imagine is pretty, pretty broad. It spans, I think, 35 different languages and 23 different markets. Uh, so they switched their customer service from being purely call center oriented to being kind of AI first and you know, providing chatbots and multilingual chatbots to kind of serve that first line of defense. And the re results were pretty astounding and immediate. So over the, la the past year, uh, you know, it handled over 2.3 million conversations, which is two thirds of all Klarna customer service chats. Um, and the second one I think is probably the most important part of this is because, you know, as much as we get excited about technology, nobody really wants to take a step back in terms of their satisfaction with the product or service. So the biggest result to me was that, um, you know, all of their customer service metrics were either on par or, or considerably better. So, so we say on par on the slide, but it's some of them like they're, time to resolution went from 11 minutes to two minutes, and they also had a 25% drop in the number of kind of repeat inquiries, which, you know, typically people who talk to somebody doesn't really satisfy their requests, and then they go back and talk to that person again. So we really lowered the amount of frustration that people have with the customer service process. And as a result, they're kind of projecting to save, uh, you know, over $40 million in 20, 2024 through this hybrid process. And they're just kind of one of the many stories we see in the marketplace. So these are a couple others. Um, so Harvey is kind of a newer AI company. They produce AI models and an AI legal system, which uh, you know, they basically improve on the models that OpenAI or others are offering in the market. And they're seeing uh, lawyer acceptance rates of over 85%, which I think is pretty astounding since every lawyer I know has always redlined every document I've given to them and not accepted anything. <laughs> Uh, Atrium Health, uh, you know, they have a physician platform that helps document clinical interactions, and they found that they were able to save 40 minutes per day of physician time, as well as increase, increase the metrics on physician uh, satisfaction and engagement. And the last one, kind of quickly to note, uh, Lonely Planet, who's kind of a travel guide creator and uh, tra travel curator, uh, is using AI to craft custom travel itineraries, which both, again, it's kind of the common theme, kind of lowers their cost by close to 80% and also provides a more personalized travel itinerary and experience for their, their consumers. So AI, I think where we're at now, is already exceeding humans in, in many tasks and it's evolving very rapidly. So even faster than a lot of the people involved and a lot of experts uh, expect. And so you look back to when ChatGPT and the, the core models, GPT-3, were first coming to market in early 2023. Since then, uh, you know, now you can get models that are more than three times as fast. Um, you have one-eighth the error rate um, and one-twelfth one of the cost, so only 8% of what it cost uh, about a year ago to build an AI-driven system. Uh, and more importantly, I think, is what these rapid enhancements uh, allow. So for the faster generation, some of the use cases like dynamically generating conversations you know, kind of get enabled the faster you go. There's actually interesting studies that we went through with the client that talk about how human connection is actually defined by the latency of conversation. So those, those things are critical to be able to replicate, uh, you know, all of these use cases and have customer satisfaction as they go through that. And on the error rate, you know, it unlocks a whole new set of use cases because there's many, many things, especially in the enterprise and business world where, you know, the bar for, starting to use a product is fairly high in terms of accuracy. So the better we get there, the more use cases that get opened up. And it's not just the language models. I, you know, it's funny. We, always, we always do these presentations. There's always a, here's everything with ChatGPT and the text models and AI models, and then don't forget about all this other stuff because <laughs> they kind of dominate the conversation. But image generation is progressing seemingly uh, as rapidly. Uh, so this is uh, basically the similar prompt uh, and a platform called Midjourney from 2022, their first version to 2024. And you can see it's gone in really about an 18 month period of time from really kind of something that's interesting, like starting to form pictures, but it's really mangled and not usable to a point where 
now I don't know how much better they'll be able to get. They're kind of producing photorealistic images. And I think a lot of the advancements in the future will be about you know, how do you control this and how do you set up stages and how do you interact uh, and, and create permanence and repetition. Video, similarly, I think has progressed faster than people thought. Um, so a couple of years ago, you know, a lot of people were calling uh, video a pipe dream. Um, this does move in the, in the actual video. I guess when we convert to PDF, it doesn't move anymore. But, um, and now you can get kind of photorealistic uh, you know, images and screenshots. They're not quite there to get you know, full length movies or anything like that, but it's enough that I think Hollywood has kind of taken notice and starting to understand that they'll need to figure out how to use this technology. One, one story that came up a, a couple weeks ago, or maybe it was about a month ago now, um, Tyler Perry, who's a you know, kind of movie producer, was planning an $800 million studio expansion and actually delayed that, citing that he thought that AI was going to disrupt the way that movies were made and he didn't want to invest you know, that significant capital in kind of the old way of doing things. And I think this one, um, you know, just to highlight, there's not really any boundaries on functionality. So we already have AI systems that um, you know, have what they call agents that are able to call non-AI services. So if you use ChatGPT, you'll see this through you know, what they call their plugin store. So it enables the AI to call other services to do things that either have private data or services that the AI may not be able to access or provide capabilities like mathematical or visualization, like shown in the slide, that they're not able to do. So the breadth of what AI can accomplish is actually broader than what AI can do itself directly. And so the pace of the innovation is a little bit jarring sometimes, but I think not to be unexpected. Um, and so you don't need to read through every single one, but the main point on this is, you know, as we've seen in history, these technical innovations and shifts come faster and faster, and then the adoption of them is also kind of accelerated as well. And so typically halves over time. So when we think about that timeline we saw with Netflix, we're two or three iterations past that, and we expect AI to move much quicker than that. And so and this one is like our view of where, where are we in the AI cycle. And we'll give kind of a couple of proof points on why we think this. So you guys have probably seen adoption curves like this. They're not, not the perfect mechanism, but I think they do mirror kind of the human behavior in terms of who dives in early and who's kind of late to you know, kind of capturing new technologies. And so I think we're past the, you know, kind of the innovator and early adopter phase. The innovators are really, I think, a lot of the businesses that created their own models were creating AI-driven businesses, you know, five, 10 years ago. In some, in some cases, you know, companies like IBM maybe have been working on this for 50 years um, the, with, with mixed commercial success. Um, you know, then I think we had the kind of wave of early adopters as ChatGPT and those models were coming to market and they were broadly accessible. And those, you know, I, I kind of loosely termed like the AI native products. I mean, there were other tech companies that were rapid adopters as well. And so that kind of puts us into this early majority period where there's a lot of you know, non-AI centric businesses who are recognizing the potential and opportunity that they see ahead of them. And also the risk, right? That things may change overnight, um, you know, and that they may be forced to do things differently, uh, you know, based on their competitors adopting and them not adopting. And so that's that's kind of the, the, I think the thing to highlight is that the companies that wait for the next year or two, which we think, uh, you know, from our perspective, I mean, I'm sure there'll be some, some laggards beyond the laggard curve there, but I think most companies will have adopted AI in some form over the next year to year and a half. And this, this kind of has some stats from uh, McKinsey uh, last year, a survey they ran in terms of you know, direct consumer use of AI. And so it kind of, kind of mirrors that, right? So we kind of drew the dotted line there in terms of you know, wh wh which, which set of people are using AI at work and work and personal. So regular business AI users and across most industries, and I guess that's another point is we see this really in everywhere, which is kind of what, part of what makes it amazing is that you know, it's at least at that or near that 16, 15% threshold of the early adopters and kind of at the start of early majority with not surprisingly tech being significantly ahead of that with uh, you know, them more willing to adopt uh, new, new and novel technologies. But despite that, though, I think what we see is a lot of companies kind of stuck in that exploration. So, um, you know, close to 70, 80 percent stuck in exploration or limited use. Um, and so you can kind of, kind of see stats like that. It causes us to pause and ask a little bit on the why. You know, why, everybody sees the benefits. Why, why are they not moving faster? Why, why is not everybody in that kind of aggressive pursuit phase? And so I'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges we see that hold people back and kind of our position on and how to push through those. Um, so the first one, I think, you know, the, the most common thing is that 
you know, unlike some previous stage phases, like with uh, big data, like with big data, it was very obvious, right? Like, do I have large data sets that I want to analyze? No? Okay, that's probably not very applicable to you. Uh, you do, then okay, now you have technology that does it. With AI, it's much more divergent. Uh, so there's many things that I can do. Each one of them have kind of like a different capability set, different relevant performance towards human alternatives, different costs. Um, so there's just sometimes like uh, you know, the ability to kind of get lost in the headlights on looking at all the different things to do and not focus in on you know, what your needs are and what you're trying to change and what the relevant capabilities are specific to your, your company's needs. Um, the other one we see a lot, um, and I, mean, I know you won't be able to read all the logos on there, but uh, this is actually a rec very recent uh, MAD landscape is the acronym, Machine Learning, Artificial Intelligence, and Data. So a little broader than just AI, but all of those are kind of coupled together and, and pretty important that uh, First Mark Capital puts out every year and is, is pretty insightful in terms of tracking the companies and organizing them. But I think what, what this creates, though, is kind of even as companies get towards the point of action, it creates this dizzying array of, okay, not only do I have to know what I want to do, I have to evaluate you know, hundreds of companies. And the reality is it's like the companies are not very mature at this point. So a lot of them cover portions of your workflow and you have to figure out which ones to stitch together. And um, you know, we, all, we all know when we're buying uh, software, there's, you have to figure out what's real and what's you know, on, the, on the website. So that process can be, be daunting to, to some consumers and people starting to get started. And then the last piece, you know, even as people get going, and, and kind of this is actually a lot of where, where we started is working with, with software companies on helping them you know, kind of understand the new technology. So a lot of it's rooted in, in kind of core software development. There's kind of what the, this is, this is uh, Andreessen Horowitz diagram that we, we, we borrowed, but kind of what they call the new LLM tech stack. So as the technology changes, there's new types of challenges that are presented um, you know, for developers. And so you have to figure that out. And even if you have in-house people who are interested, it takes them a while to get up to speed or you have to bring on new people. And so that kind of causes a pause, even as some folks have a, a kind of plan for action there. And so a lot of what we focus on is building a repeatable process to do this uh, you know, at scale. I think it's funny, some of these statistics, uh, you know, I like them because they get perspective, but what, it, what they do is sometimes portray AI adoption as a, a one-time event. Like, oh, I you know, opened up ChatGPT, I've adopted AI, it's over, right? And the reality is it's a, kind of an ongoing process. So even companies that have had success, like Klarna that we showed, right? Like, that's their customer service process. There's still pieces in product that they can do. There's still other, other ways that it'll change their business. And so we think it's really important to have a process that spawns from you know, what we call kind of the research phase where you focus um, you know, on gathering information both about the company and the technology uh, through planning, you know, where you kind of go through and create tactical plans that incrementally get you towards that strategy as well as you know, kind of that development and then roll out. And we'll talk a little bit more about those individually and how we approach those. So on the research side, uh, it's really more than just research. So one thing a lot of companies come to us with uh, is you know, just the fact that they're even having difficulty having kind of the, the conversations internally because it's so new and different folks have had different capability or capacity to really keep up with change in technology. So, so a lot of times we start with training where, you know, helps everyone get that common language, common understanding set of what the capabilities, use cases are that people are working on in the ecosystem. And then kind of pair that with both internal and externally focused uh, research processes, which really focuses a lot on taking the best of design research and applying it to AI and really trying to get a deep understanding before you move forward. And a lot of times the outcome for this and one of the intermediate steps is to create a, a kind of company strategy and roadmap. And those, those are really important in helping everybody see um, you know, kind of thinking back to Netflix, making sure you see where you're going, right? So it's not just like, hey, we're going to try this out in customer service and then that's it, right? People can see incrementally how you're going there um, and, the, and the path that they use, they need to follow to get there. The planning phase, so plans for us, I think really mean, uh, you know, the specific tactical plans. And, and so that can vary widely depending on the type of project or you know, process that you're working on, whether it's redesigning a workflow or integrating AI into your product. Um, but the common things is that you have like those tactical steps to get there and as well. And this one I think is probably the most important piece of you know kind of what we focus on planning is you know, the metrics to measure success. So one one thing that kind of uh, you know it's somebody's worked in uh, product management and software is kind of difficult to deal with with AI is that the success is not binary. So you know it's like if you have a customer success re response, 
how do you know if it's good, right? And so you have to create kind of new types of metrics, new types of measurement systems, especially if you want to measure them you know, early on in the process, then before you get to the results like Klarna had, where you can say, okay, you know, we've, we've gotten 2 million conversations, we can see what their performance-based metrics are. You want to see the kind of live real-time you know, error rates and you know, are these misleading, are these good? So there's new mechanisms and KPIs to, to do that now. On the development side, I would say like, you know, 80% of software development doesn't change. It's just, you know, we spend a lot of time investing in internal experiments uh, to test out kind of the latest technologies, especially around, um, you know, a lot of the technologies around, you know, kind of platforms for AI. So the models, I think, are progressing and, uh, you know, continuing to evolve. But a lot of the platforms for developing software and monitoring and, and doing that. So we spend a lot of time experimenting there and then kind of couple that with, you know, kind of agile best practices, making sure that, we bite off pieces that are manageable and deliver value in kind of an incremental way. And we'll talk, talk a little bit more about rollout, because actually, especially up front, a lot of people don't think about this. But, you know, what we see in the ecosystem is that, you know, it's really kind of fraught with peril when you're bringing either, either AI out internally or in product. So and taking a step back, I mean, there is a lot of, I think, both fear and trepidation from consumers that, you know, AI will replace them or even they're not just sure, like, what they're expected to do it. Like if your company releases a new chat GPT like tool, right? Are you, are you expected to change the responses or is it okay if you send those out, you know, as is because you've invested in that tool. And so it's really critical to manage the expectations there um, around things like errors and usage and rights and all that stuff. That's kind of a new world experience where, you know, both best practices and regulations still being established. So back, back to Blockbuster. Uh, so I think as we look back at that, you know, I think really the key takeaway as we apply it to AI is not that um, it's necessarily hard to uh, you know, recognize you're in that moment. Um, this is kind of one of the one of the diagrams I referenced. This is actually from a 2005 Blockbuster statement where they were still doing pretty well at that point, and you know, kind of the, you don't have to read all the text, but the headline is that you know they recognize that online is an opportunity that they can't ignore, right? And just if you read as you read into the language, I think you realize that they equated online with people going to a website and subscribing to DVD rentals or selecting which DVDs to rent and getting it mailed to them. And nowhere in here does it really talk about you know streaming, and, and it does come into play in some of their later statements. But you know, even in recognition of those change moments, you know they weren't necessarily able to come up with the plan and, and plan with conviction to to execute. And so yeah, I think our takeaway is that. It's easy to recognize things are going to change. I think many people see that AI is going to be impactful. It's that, you know, kind of creating and executing that winning AI strategy is what's, what's much harder, right? Because it's unique to each business. And so, you know, that's where we focus a lot of our time and energy because it is hard, but we think, you know, kind of with the right process that it becomes possible, um, you know, and worth it. Um, so thanks for that. And we'll take some questions. Thank you very much. Uh, we're actually going to start with the online audience this time. So David, a question from our online audience is analogous to previous technology adoption. Is the cost of adopting AI expected to significantly decline in the years ahead or is the value prop to users so great that AI vendors will not wit witness margin compression anytime soon? The complicated one. It, I, I'll say I'm going to give an answer with a, a good amount of opinion in it. Um, so I, I think it will continue to uh, decrease in costs, um, both both from technology changes and then also the competitive environment. One of one of the interesting things is that you know, there's this unique mass set of funding, both from the venture community and from the largest tech providers. So Amazon, Microsoft, Google are all kind of betting the house on AI, um, and they're there. I think they'll be the kind of pay, primary drivers of the continued cost compression because most of their interest is actually not in making money off AI from, from my perception. It's in winning the cloud business away from Amazon. So Google and Microsoft are actually finally having success in getting cloud partnerships, which can be, you know, the AI portion may be a million dollar business for them, but the overall cloud partnership can be a hundred million dollar business. So they'll continue to put price pressure on some of these newer startups. Uh, and I, I don't think that'll, that'll stop for the next couple of years. All right, we have time for just one more question. My question goes to artificial intelligence and customer service. Okay, so 
you're saying basically, or from, from your slides, it seemed that it was just people had a better experience with artificial intelligence. I mean, maybe I'm old school, but sometimes it's just so frustrating and you can't get to the right person to a point where you just hang up and just say, you know what, it's not worth it. So do you, is that when you say that a customer is like, quote unquote, satisfied, are they satisfied or they just didn't reach out a second time? Yeah, no, I, I think that's, it's, they ha they do have like satisfaction surveys and metrics, which have their, are, are fraught with their own power. I wouldn't say I'm an expert on customer experience surveys, but you know, obviously people who are very happy or very annoyed can kind of, kind of go there. I, I think where there is a benefit and, and kind of key point is that people aren't moving to kind of AI only systems or moving it to, to more of these hybrid systems, right? Where AI handles that first triage and are probably actually more responsive than humans in the like, hey, I need to talk to somebody else. I need to talk to your manager because they have ways to translate that and route that to the right people. Whereas, you know, when you're running a, a human driven service desk, you know, they're trained to make a couple of passes at it before they go up to that next level. And so I, I think there's opportunity for kind of better routing um, as well as like the AI systems are able to like instantly search the you know full archive of documentation and email things over so there's there's things and that, that's where you saw that represented in like the decrease from 11 minutes to two minutes they're able to respond to whatever you're thrown at them and you know, as they get more robust and build out you know provide that response and information immediately doesn't make the products better but <laughs> all right dave thank you very much for your time uh, again, to our in-person audience, if you'd like to learn a bit more, there are opportunities for small group as well as one-on-one -on -one meetings.
All right. Hello, our next presentation is from Dr. Suresh Venkatasan, Executive Chairman and CEO of Poet Technologies, which trades on the NASDAQ under the symbol POET. As a reminder to the in-person attendees immediately following the presentation, manageably in the front conference room for a breakout session if you'd like to meet with them there. If you'd like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one meeting with them, please see the Water Tower desk. Dr. Venkatasan and Thomas, welcome. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for your time this morning. Um, I'll spend the next few minutes talking to you about what POET does, uh, specifically in the, in the sphere of artificial intelligence. Um, we are a pure play data comm hardware company. Um, so we specialize in data communication hardware solutions uh, for the broad AI market. Um, so uh, a bit about the company. Um, you know, we are particularly focused on leading edge uh, high-speed data transmission, and this is at data rates at 800 gigabits per second and beyond, uh, which is really the, the sweet spot and the largest growing segment of the optical communication market within the sphere of AI hardware solutions. We have developed over the past five years at POET uh, what we believe is an industry disruptive technology platform. Um, we have customers that are uh, currently engaged with us and are validating the technology uh, and our te technology is qualified for production and we expect to start generating production revenue over the course of this year and then into next. Um, we are present in extremely large, high growth, multi-billion dollar markets, um, especially now with uh, with the significant growth of AI and, and the demand for AI clusters and the data center networks that support them. Um, we are in deep tech. Um, we are, um, you know, um, we have developed proprietary technology that are well protected by patents and trade secrets. Um, and we believe, you know, uh, we, are, we are kind of an undiscovered gem, if you will, within the overall AI hardware sphere. Uh, we're a micro cap, um, although we're listed, you know, jointly on both the TSX Venture as well as the NASDAQ. Uh, when people talk about AI, you know, we like to kind of categorize it into, you know, three pillars, if you will. Um, you know, one is largely software and services related, right? Everything to do with ChatGPT, OpenAI, um, a bunch of the software companies de developing what we would consider to be AI solutions. Um, then on the extreme right side, there's the pillar around processing, right? So these are the companies that provide processing and compute power capabilities uh, to support, if you will, um, the growth in AI. And then there's the intermediate segment, which is communications, right? And these are communication links that connect processor elements together. GPUs to memories, GPUs to GPUs, or server-to-server -server communication. So communication links inside of AI servers and communication links inside of data centers that agglomerate these AI servers is a key piece of the overall segment of, of artificial intelligence. Um, look, I've been in the industry for uh, over 30 years. You know, when I first joined the industry in the early 90s, um, hardware was in fashion, right? And, and companies like Intel and Cisco and others, you know, really got a lot of valuation demand on them because hardware was actually lagging, if you will, the ability of software to take advantage of it. We then went through a couple of decades um, in the 2000s where all the value shifted to software because the hardware underlying the software was plenty good. And, you know, apps came out and, you know, a lot of the cloud service platforms, software as a service, all of those, fintech, I mean, you know, so there was a lot of value placed, if you will, on software. But we now see the pendulum changing and moving again in 2020, starting 2020. It's, uh, it's again, the, the, the era of hardware, right? And, and if you look at companies that are driving insane valuations in the AI segment are largely hardware companies. Uh, NVIDIA and likes, right, and everyone down the chain. Um, so we see ourselves very well positioned uh, in this decade of hardware growth as a company that is supporting the hardware activities around AI, in particular around communications. 
Um, you know, when people talk about servers, they talk about artificial intelligence, data centers. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, is often overlooked is um, is the communication medium, and and um, and that's where Poet comes in. We provide these what are called optical modules uh, or transceivers, and these are basically critical hardware segments that convert electrical signal to optical signal for transmission. Um, the easiest way to think about what we do is uh, is, is the analogy with Wi-Fi, right? Um, a Wi-Fi router that you have in your home, no doubt, uh, converts electrical signal into RF, and it transmits that RF signal over air, and then you know it's it's received at the other end by your computer or whatever device you've got, and and that completes the link. Uh, likewise, uh, what we do is the equivalent of Wi-Fi in the optical space where we convert electrical signals into light. And light is then used as the medium for communication uh, for a variety of reasons. You know, light has historically been the fastest form of communication, of course, and it also historically has also driven the lowest power consumption um, because electrons typically uh, consume a lot of heat uh, as they transmit through wires, and and photons or light do not have that. So, so we believe that you know um, this growth in optical communication links is is starting and and is just exploding over the decade. And at Poet, we've developed solutions that enable these optical links to be manufactured or produced at a scale that is otherwise not contemplatable without technologies like a, like what Poet has developed in the form of integration. From a market perspective, I mean, clearly there's an extreme demand for these high-speed optical modules. Um, I mean, NVIDIA, uh, in the space of two years, has you know, become one of the largest consumers of optical modules in the world um, because they have realized very quickly that you know, all of their um, you know, inter-GPU AI server racks uh, need to communicate optically in, in order to keep up with the bandwidth demands um, that AI, you know, places on these servers, especially when it comes to training. Um, and the amount of memory and the amount of compute power is, it is immense, and the data throughput is immense, uh, which requires optics. Um, so you can see that, you know, there's a real inflection point in growth uh, for these 800 gigabits per second. Um, data communication modules starting, you know, last year actually, and then really growing over the course of the next five years. Um, and we expect that growth to be about 30% from a, you know, cumulative uh, aggregate growth, growth rate perspective. But if you just focus in on the high speed segment, which is 800 gig and 1.6 terabit, it's almost a 65% growth. And we believe we're well positioned today. We've developed solutions in that market. We're starting to sample customers now. Um, and, and it enables us to capitalize on, on this inflection point that we see largely driven by, by AI. Um, I think most people um, that are analysts in the field will say AI has added you know, about $17 billion to $30 billion of optical transceiver sales, which are these optical modules that I've talked about, over the course of the next five years. And we don't see that trend changing dramatically because, um, listen, you know, I, <laughs> uh, an, an NVIDIA server consumes 12,000 watts of power. I mean, just as a point of reference, a human brain to do the same thing is 25 watts, just so you get a sense of what that disparity is in terms of power consumption. So, you know, as more and more applications are driving the use of AI, we think that overall need to reduce power consumption, reduce latency is going to just become more and more. And, and we think we're the starting, you know, at the beginning of, of a kind of a new wave, if you will, of, of photonics growth or optical growth. And we think we're well positioned to be able to capitalize on that. And what makes Poet different? I mean, obviously, there are companies out there that are making optical modules. Um, but I would say about 80 to 90 percent of the modules that are manufactured today um, are done, honestly, in you know, job shops, uh, garage operations, uh, largely in China. That's where most of the manufacturing of these uh, modules has moved to over the past 20 or 30 years. And these are labor-intensive 
build of materials intensive uh, processes. Um, they use still esoteric manufacturing techniques from back in the 1990s. Um, and what Poet's been able to do over the course of this past five years is we've developed technology that automates production, um, you know, dramatically easing both cost as well as capital um, in terms of manufacturing these optical modules. Um, and we use basically state-of-the-art semiconductor technology to be able to do that. Um, you know, I've been in semiconductors for 30 plus years and I'm using our collective experience in semiconductor technology development and manufacturing investment and applying it, if you will, to the world of photonics. And, and we've kind of coined the phrase inside a poet, we call it semiconductorizing the manufacturing and assembly of optical engines, which is you know, bringing the manufacturing of optical engines really more to the semiconductor era that can leverage the economies of scale um, that semiconductor manufacturing has provided the world, right, through Moore's law and everything else. So why do we want to do that? Um, you know, we think that, um, you know, existing manufacturing techniques can satisfy the world's demands for optical transceivers as it existed this past decade, right? So through the through the growth in cloud data centers, et cetera. But with this new wave of growth with AI, you know, we think that these manufacturing techniques are going to be uh, very, very difficult to scale. Um, they just require more people, more widgets, and and, and and they just don't have the automation needed. And so we believe that the time is ripe for a fundamental change or shift in how photonics components are assembled and manufactured. And that's why we've been pushing this term semiconductorization of photonics. I think we started this um, in 2018. And, you know, today, most people, and I was at the uh, uh, conference a couple of weeks ago at the Fiber Conference, which is the largest optical conference in the world, and most people admit and acknowledge that, you know, what we've been pioneering over the past several years is, in fact, likely to be the standard in, in which, um, you know, optical devices are going to be manufactured in the future. Um, and the advantages we bring are, um, you know, your typical advantages in semiconductors, right? Cost, size, scale, capital uh, reduction, and, and versatility. Um, you know, we're able to spin a lot of different products uh, with our integration approach um, to, to suit the needs of, you know, various customers. Um, and, and provide that degree of versatility um, to the manufacturing process. Um, so we've started this development back in 2018 and, you know, spent the first three years really perfecting the technology. Um, and then in 22 and 23, really started putting out products um, that we called kind of optical engines. These are sub-assemblies, if you will. So if you're manufacturing a car, we were manufacturing an engine. Um, so that's what we were doing in 22 and 23. So we were selling these engines to customers. Um, but, you know, going this year and beyond, you know, we're going to make the car, right? So we're going to make the optical modules ourselves, which we believe vertically integrating ourselves to generating that module provides uh, us a, a distinct advantage in, in the solutions that we, we have to offer. And, and so we're kind of moving our business, um, you know, systematically to kind of building the whole car, right? If you were an electric car manufacturer, you sell batteries, you sell the car. And so I think we've kind of developed the technology first, sold the intermediate sub-assembly sub next, and now we're moving forward towards kind of building the, the entire module, which we believe is going to provide, you know, us with significant growth opportunities as we kind of cut out the middleman, if you will, and go to the end user directly. Um, you know, this week and last, uh, this past month, we've announced that we've kind of got our first 800 gigabit modules, uh, and we're going to be starting to sample those to, you know, key customers over the course of this year. Uh, and not only that, you know, we're one of the, I, I would say, a handful of companies, literally, uh, to have demonstrated a couple of weeks ago, 1.6 terabit solutions that are now scalable to 3.2 terabits, right? So we've got a roadmap for the next two years 
ironed out and and you know kind of ready to execute within the company so um we're we're really focused on the high end i mean we've got customers on uh, today um that are the low end they were really you know kind of alpha or customers for us in the sense that they helped us validate our technology helped us iron out all the technical and manufacturing issues and have brought us kind of to the point of manufacturing scale um but really for us to you know kind of go next level uh it's it's the 800 gig and beyond and that's where we're focused on and we're happy to be um you know right there when the market requirements are being uh, meted out to us if you will by our end users from a competitive standpoint you know we we stand alone uh in terms of what we're doing i mean there are a lot of companies doing optical modules uh clearly um most of them are in the conventional assembly regime um some of them have a degree of integration uh but no one has the complete solution as it results as, as a result of semiconductorization that poet has so you know we we do have a lead if you will on the competition in this regard uh although we're you know, a de minimis sized company compared to the giants you see on the left. But I think that gives us an outsized opportunity uh, to succeed in the market. Um, and um, and we've got a key, key few design wins uh, that we believe we can capitalize on over the next couple of years to be able to really cement our growth and leadership in the space. Um, the interesting thing about this list is, um, you know, this is a list of the top companies, if you will, in 2022. If you just go back 10 years, uh, only two of the companies actually existed on this list. Um, and that's to say that, you know, when there are when markets change and inflections happen, uh, you can see a dramatic change in the top players. Right. And that's true in any industry. And it's particularly so in, in photonics. So we think that you know we've got this inflection of growth due to AI. Uh, we've got a disruptive technology that is well positioned to capitalize on that growth. And therefore, we believe we are well positioned to disrupt, if you will, the more traditional supply chain. And uh, not only through the sale of modules, but also potentially um, licenses and other agreements that we can have with some of these big players um that could capitalize on the technology that we've we've developed right uh within the company um so we do have products that are designed in with customers uh, we've got you know 400 gig 800 gig solutions already designed in uh, uh adva is a large european networking company uh luxshare is of course one of the largest suppliers to apple but they've also got a module uh, optical module division uh, that is uh, designed us in. Um, Celestial AI is an up and coming startup company. They've raised a ton of capital on a lot of valuation, making um, you know photonics chips for GPU memory uh, interactions, and and were designed into that company as well. Um, and then we've got a smattering of other companies in China uh, that are designing our solutions. In the, the good thing is, you know we. These solutions do go to some fairly large players in the in the end market in terms of users, um, and um, and so we're well positioned from a market acceptance standpoint that this is a technology that can meet the requirements of the market and is in fact capable of scaling up. So so these are key customers for us that are going to drive revenue for us in 2024 and 2025, and then of course the new products that we're introducing into the market today. Uh, at 800 gig and beyond are really what's going to propel us forward. Uh, in terms of manufacturing, of course, um, you know, we, we can't achieve manufacturing scale without the investments needed in capital. And, and we're prepared through a joint venture that we did um, in China uh, with, uh, with a company called Sanan. Um, they've put in a lot of the investment in terms of capital. Um, so that didn't require any cash investment from poets. So we were able to leverage, um, you know, our, our intellectual property from an assembly know-how perspective to be able to create this joint venture. Um, and that joint venture is a, is a straight state-of-the-art clean room facility that's been established to take our technology to kind of the next level uh, of, of manufacturing. Um, 
Poet owns about 70% equity stake in this joint venture. So there is, of course, the opportunity for Poet to uh, to get a non-dilutive kind of, you know, capital injection of the company through liquidation of some of our equity stake, um, which we expect to happen over the course of the next year, especially as we start ramping into manufacturing, and then we can attract additional investors into that joint venture as well. Um, of course, no company is complete without a management team. Um, you know, we've got a team across the world um, that I believe are world class and, and, and with very deep semiconductor and photonics hardware expertise. Um, yeah, I've been in the industry for over 30 years. Um, I graduated with my PhD at Purdue. Um, I was at Motorola, um, and then at, I was the senior vice president and chief technology officer at Global Foundries, uh, which is the second largest semiconductor foundry in the world. Um, Vivek, um, who is also our president and general manager, uh, he's been in the optics domain for over 30 years. And so I think, you know, we have a good experience base of both people from semiconductors as well as people from traditional optics. And we're able to blend a team that you know has been able to execute. Uh, honestly, for a 50-person company, you know we're at the cutting, bleeding edge of technology at 1.6 terabits per second, which is testament to both the technology in terms of its capability and simplicity, uh, but also a testament to you know what the team's been able to accomplish. So, and and Tom Micah, who's our CFO, is also you know extremely experienced in semiconductor hardware um, over over the period of time uh, as well. So I think we're well positioned as a team to execute on our mission going forward. And, and, and we do recognize that at the end of the day, investors do invest in people. Um, and so we, we, you know, I do believe we've got a terrific team that can capitalize on all of our innovations in the company and be able to take this company to the next level. Um, in the near term, we expect our revenue over the next couple of years to be in the you know ten to twenty million dollars um, with customers that are already uh, designed us in, and we expect those customers to be ramping over the course of the second half of this year, and then of course into next year. Uh, as eight hundred gig and one point six terabits per second cement, then over the midterm, we really do expect that revenue to ramp quite rapidly. Um, because it doesn't require us to get a lot of share of the market to be able to get this kind of revenue, um, because it's a very, very large market that we're playing in. And, and because we're a semiconductor company fundamentally um, and semiconductor hardware company, uh, we do expect that gross margins would be very, very consistent with conventional semiconductor technology companies um, so healthy margins in the 40 to 50 percent range. So key metrics, um, you know, we are um, on the TSX Venture Exchange as well as uh, traded on the NASDAQ. Um, you know, our uh, total outstanding shares, a little over 48 million, um, fully diluted shares at 63 million. Uh, we don't have any debt in the company, um, so we have a market cap of about 63 million U.S. dollars. Um, I think we're trading at the low end of what we had, um, you know, the courses this past year, um, and 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 so we do think this is a great opportunity, especially as we are, um, you know, getting into this manufacturing and revenue generation uh, stage of the company. Um, we do burn about three million dollars of cash, and um, and we expect um, you know to continue to inject capital both through um, equity as well as non-equity raises, and we're really focused very heavily on the non-equity raise uh, related to technology licensing agreements that we're in discussions with, as well as um, you know some of our dilution of our equity interest in our joint venture that would inject capital into the company. So we do expect that over the course of this coming year that you know we would be able to capitalize the company very effectively to take advantage of the growth opportunities that we have ahead of us. So that's, um, that's about POET, and I'll turn it over to the audience for questions. Uh, John, you wanna start? Oh, all right.
Yeah, hi, Suresh. Uh, just to uh, go back in the capital structure and cash burn, you, it seems like you've got maybe two or three quarters left of cash, but then you mentioned future uh, funding from licensing and JV dilution. You know, does that, ha those combined get you to break even or do you, do you foresee that you may need to go back to the markets at some point in time in the next, I don't know, 12 to 18 months? Well, I think it's a balance. I mean, we, we do expect um, that, you know, between the two, that we would generate, you know, sufficient uh, capital within the company to break even. So I would say it's not all one or the other. Uh, we don't expect to raise all of the money through an equity and a, and a dilutive raise at this point in time. I think we're well positioned with both our technology as well as recognition in the market in terms of what we can do to be able to get some non-dilutive financing into the company. Right. And you've uh, had some public announcements about i think the 800 um uh uh mega uh, gig gig, yeah. gig market right recently is there is there another milestone that maybe investors can hold on to as a as a you know um, um you know benchmark or flag along the way that says oh okay you know what uh now we can expect to see more maybe more consistent or yeah tra I mean greater trajectory yeah, I think you know we 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 continue our development trajectory both in terms of technology and products as well as customer acquisition, right? And um, I think back in November, you know, we did some financing within the company, and um, I was asked the same question: is like, what are the milestones that we have? And I told them that we expect to be able to make certain announcements in March, which we did, right? Um, so likewise, um, you know, we would expect over the course of the coming quarter to have additional product announcements as well as additional partner and or customer announcements around especially the leading edge, right? So we, uh, you know, we're working on, you know, things today, I mean, based on, you know, our solutions that we had announced a couple of weeks ago. So, you know, they, those take a little bit of time to cook, but, you know, we expect over the course of the quarter to be able to show that, you know, some of these leading edge solutions are in fact being taken up and, and it's driving a lot of excitement. Uh, like I said, at 1.6 terabits per second, um, you know, what we're seeing is a massive acceleration of bandwidth demand, if you will, um, because of AI. And we were literally, you know, I could count the number of companies that were demonstrating 1.6 terabits on one hand at the conference, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, and we were one of them. So there is a lot of interest in in working with us on generating, you know, these solutions, which is really important, um, especially in this segment, you know, it's kind of really important to get really out of the bleeding edge and then, and then that the, the solutions then kind of dry trickle down from there. Um, so we're, we're well positioned there and we're happy about that. Dr. Venkatsen, thank you very much. Um, if you have any other questions for him, he is available to meet after this and in one-on-one -on -one meetings throughout the day. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you.
Tell us when we're ready to start, guys. No rush. Okay, which way? Sorry. All right. Yeah. That's fine. Well, the lighting's got to be just right to catch the circles under my eyes. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome to the next company presenting today. It's back. Um, today we are very pleased to have the CEO, Andy Main, and the CFO, Karen Alexander. I'm John Roy, by the way. I'm sorry to mention that. I uh, cover technology here at Water Tower Research. I've been doing it about four years with Water Tower. Previously, let's see, UBS, Hambrick, Janney, and Merrill Lynch, over about 30 years of sell-side research. So I've been doing this for quite a while. Um, and very pleased to present these guys. They were asking me earlier this morning, you know, what really makes you like back? I said, well, the history of the company, which Andy will go into a little bit, and also the trends, the potential, where it's headed, and things like that. So, Andy, welcome. Karen, welcome. Thanks, Thanks. so much for coming on. Um, can you give us maybe a little bit of your background and a little bit of background on back? Oh, yeah, sure, John. Well, it's nice to see you again. Absolutely. And uh, thanks to everyone here today uh, coming. Good, good to see everybody. Um, so I'm. Uh, this is my third week into the role as Bax's uh, new CEO, and uh, prior to prior to that, I had a career um, running Deloitte Digital for uh, almost like seven years. One of the founders of Deloitte Digital and scaled that into a pretty large business. Then went on to uh, be the CEO of Ogilvy, which was the large creative agency, and uh, turned that company around fairly rapidly. Um, and I've been on the back board for um, you know, just slightly over two years and was part of the board when the, the back piece happened. And with uh, Gavin's departure, um, I sort of came in to basically be the, the new CEO of, of BAGD. And there's really sort of three things we're looking to get done. So one is to uh, sort of grow our business and to find sort of new markets to expand in as well as to reinforce our current markets. Second, to sort of bring new offers to the market, particularly in the institutional space. And then thirdly, is to really look at our expense base to try and um, sort of prudently manage like what, what we spend our money on, all to improve EBITDA at the end of the day. So that's just a little bit about uh, myself, and you might want to go over to... Sure. Tom. Karen, why don't you give me a little your, your background? And, and yeah. Maybe um, so I have been with BACT for almost three years, approaching my three-year anniversary. I came from a company that was very different than BACT. I came from GE Capital, um, which, so I kind of did a 180, um, going from a large, um, you know, a little bit more traditional um, uh, uh, finance company space um, in you know, to this company where what really attracted me was the opportunity to work on a truly kind of disruptive, um, innovative technology. So, you know, when I think of crypto today, there's you know, a lot of people who think about it as primarily a source of you know, investment and slash speculation. Um, but when you really dig into what crypto is and like the original thesis for crypto, um, it, the use case was not one of speculation and store of value as much as it was of enabling transactions through the um, uh, through the infrastructure that crypto, the rails that crypto runs on. Um, to, so to be able to come to a company that was really focused on that was an exciting opportunity. Um, when I came, we were in the process of going public through a DSPAC. Um, which um, was an interesting journey. Um, I think the you know, we were there in uh, 2021 um, and had a very uh, interesting Venn diagram of trying to go public through a DSPAC and then also being a, a crypto company. Um, so that process did take a while with the SEC. I think the original S4 was filed in um, April of 2021, and we basically, you know, didn't clear the SEC until October of 2021. Um, so I came in, um, you know, we were very lucky, and one of the things I actually really liked about the company is that it was innovative, but then, you know, it had the ICE DNA and heritage. So I think, you know, ICE did a great job of establishing the company in a way that was very mindful of being um, 
uh, regulatorily um, you know, focused and very you know compliant focused in terms of how we built the company. You know the yeah you know, the first thing that ICE did was set up a separate trust entity that was separately licensed by NYDFS as an independent board of directors, um, and really, basically, they originally built it to be the um, the custody function for a physically delivered Bitcoin future product. Um, from there, I think the you know the evolution of the company to find other um, opportunities and other market demand out there for using that trust infrastructure just just naturally grew. So if you think about what we do today, it's it's you know the the custody core, but we're really providing um, the also the trading platform um, for both uh, retail traders and institutional traders on that custody core. Um, and then we also have a loyalty business, loyalty redemption business, which I kind of think of as a different flavor of uh, digital assets. Um, some, you know, it's not crypto, but it's this notion of taking a broader digital asset and making it um, useful and being able to transact in that. So it, you know, that focus and that combination of opportunity is what really brought me to the company. Um, yeah, we did go public, um, you know, close the lease back in October of 2021. Uh, we've since been evolving with where the market demand has been taking us. Um, so, you know, for instance, yeah, the original business thesis for the company was primarily a direct-to-consumer model through an, um, an app that would be marketed directly to consumers. We, you know, quickly saw actually a, an opportunity to fine-tune that, fine that and actually improve that a bit by moving more to a B2B to C model. So instead of going directly to consumers, we're really focused on working through, um, our clients are basically businesses that want to, or have a good business case to bring crypto trading to their customers. So we found that to be a very efficient business model in terms of go-to-market with a much lower CAC. Um, and it blends very nicely with the fact that on the institution side, we are also working directly with businesses. Um, so, you know, we've continued to evolve that. We, I think we've been opportunistic as, you know, the company has evolved. You know, originally we had a lot of relationships with uh, traditional finance companies, you know, like Pfizer and Finestra working through their network. Um, we had an opportunity um, in you know in 2022 to acquire a company called Apex Crypto that had great relationships with the fintech side of the space um, and have been able to basically to expand that B2B to B2C to footprint while continuing to invest on the institutional side of the business where we see a lot of opportunity. You know, being a public company, uh, being regulated by NYDFS. Um, we find those, you know, especially with some of the turmoil that happened in the crypto space um, in starting in 2022 into 2023, um, you know, our, our status, our transparency, the level of regulation and the investment that we put into it, um, it's, you know, we have a, you know, we're seeing demand in that in the market now, um, you know, on both sides of the business, but really on the institutional side of the business where, institutional players really want to have some diversification and yeah, us being a qualified custodian, publicly traded and very transparent, um, we've been able to take advantage of those opportunities. So, you know, it, when I think about where I've come from and why I joined BACT, it's, you know, BACT looks different today than what it did almost three years ago when I, when I uh, first came to the company, but it is very much, uh, you know, a, a great story and you know, actually a lot of fun to see the evolution of the market and where our capabilities fit in. And a super point Karen makes about like our clients, because we are like our clients' partners in growth, um, because we give them the capability so they can sort of trade and then we provide the security. But our business philosophy is to be our clients' partners in that growth with, with their own customers. And so we, we help them achieve that as, as in, in that partnership. So people think, well, it's a platform. Well, for sure. But that platform comes with this ambition to help our clients and their, their growth goals with their, with their customers. So it's a very awesome sort of client experience that we deliver to, uh, to achieve that.
Now, you were spun out of ICE originally, right? And you're trading on the NYSE, right? Yes. And just for everybody else, BKKT. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And um, now, you have a Bitcoin license, right? There aren't that many of those out there, are they? Yeah. Yeah. So, so we have a Bitcoin license through um, NYDFS. Um, and you know, originally, actually, up until recently, we had two Bitcoin licenses because we had the one that BAFT um, uh, had when it was developing. And then when we bought Apex Crypto, um, we got a second Bitcoin license, which we definitely don't need to. Um, one of the big opportunities that we have to further um, you know, streamline expenses and our capital allocation is through the merger of those two legal entities, which NYDFS did approve last month. So... Um, the idea with that we only want to need one Bitcoin license, which we, we will have, and it's with NYDFS, which, I, you know, there are other jurisdictions where you can get a Bitcoin license. We, we made a decision to use NYDFS because we really felt it was the gold standard in terms of what the options were at the time, um, in terms of just the level of scrutiny that they, in oversight that they give to companies. Um, we thought it was actually really important to be able to then go to our clients and basically say that we are at NYDFS levels. So you reported not too long ago, maybe you can hit the highlights of the last quarter and the last year. Yeah, yeah, so we were able to report earnings, it seems like a, a long time ago, but it was about three weeks ago. Um, so the fourth quarter was, it, it was a solid quarter. Um, on the revenue side, there's two parts of our business, um, you know, crypto trading. When you look at my income statement, you see a lot of big gross numbers. I have to report on a gross basis, gross crypto volume, and then crypto uh, cost and what we call execution clearing and brokerage fees, or ECB for short, because it's a mouthful. Um, you know, netting those together, we delivered 1.6 million of that on a net basis, um, which is pretty consistent with where we were in Q3. But what was exciting when we looked at the evolution of what happened in Q4 is we really started to see an uptick, and, and I think the whole industry did, in terms of increased retail engagement um, as the quarter went on. And that's really continued into the first quarter of 24. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you that we, we ended the quarter, yeah, end of March this year, the market was up on a volume perspective about 96%. Um, we were up over 300%. Um, so again, that the, the customer base of our clients, um, you know, they are definitely engaging um, and active in the space, not only in the kind of more mainstream coins like Bitcoin and ETH, but we are seeing a resurgence of demand for coins like Shiba Inu um, and, and that. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's great that we have our partnerships with the clients in terms of having their customers really seeing the opportunity to increase their engagement in space. I think that the Bitcoin ETF approval probably helped that in terms of what it did with prices. But again, we're not just seeing it in Bitcoin. Maybe you could go into what that was in terms of when that happened. It was not too long ago, right? It wasn't. So I think I'm going off of memory now. I think it was in January that the SEC finally allowed, after a lot of deliberation, um, Bitcoin ETFs to to launch. Um, you know, it, as as we see it, it's it's a net good thing for the entire space. You know, I think about that by comparison to stocks. You know, with stocks, you have index funds and ETFs, but that doesn't in that doesn't totally dampen the, the demand for traders that want to still trade directly in the coin. So I think just the general embrace of the coin, it, you know, it's helpful for prices, um, you, know, tr you know, trading loves volatility, so it was helpful for that. Um, and we continue to see strong demand um, in terms of within the customer base of our clients uh, wanting to trade directly with coins. Right, yeah. So. Andy, maybe you could give us a little view of your goals for 2024. Yeah, sure. Um, so it's really simple, right? So um, the first is to really reinforce what we do for our current clients and to help them improve their transaction volume with their customers because if our clients grow, we grow. So that, that's, uh, that stands to reason. Um, we're also um, going pretty big into the institutional space. Uh, just with the, the ETF uh, question that, that you asked. And one of the things we're going to be uh, building 
I mean, it's currently in play as an ECN to help the Spot Bitcoin ETF players come together into a forum whereby we can do sort of really sort of fast trades, low latency, and sort of lower costs, you know, for that community that needs to come together to do that. So that's going to be sort of coming out in the sort of early, early summer, we'll be pleased to say. But the institutional market at large is just very interesting, just with like things like, like staking and lending. And we need to sort of evaluate our offers in, in light of that. And then the other thing going on in back too is just to really prudently manage our expense base. Uh, market certainly looks at us and says, well, you guys need to get your, your costs more under control relative to your aspiration and your revenue. So that's one thing we're certainly working on to and to deliver you know, improved value back to our shareholders as a, as a result. So that's just some of the, the, the things certainly going on. Um, around all, of course, is um, what we call the BAC ecosystem. So BAC operates in, in, the, in the crypto world, and in that world, we've got many sort of partners with whom we work. And these partners, we certainly like to go to market with them. So one we recently announced was uh, Unchained. Uh, for collaborative custody, but it's really to build stronger go-to-market relationships with the back ecosystem and the partners that we hang out with. So together we can go to our clients and sort of jointly sort of make the market and build the market. So this whole notion of the back ecosystem is quite, quite a strong one for, for us. So that's basically at a very high level what we're, what we're up to in the not-so-distant future, right? To, yeah. Uh, Super on track on this business. That brings up two kind of follow-on questions to that. One is, uh, so collaborative custody, is that something that's kind of mm. digital assets? Or is that something? That's yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly a concept and an offer which has taken hold in the marketplace. So what it basically does, it splits the key up into multiple parties. So the, the key for the crypto and under that premise, it therefore should be safer uh, because if, if you're trying to hack it, it's kind of hard to hack it when it's you know, held in different, different places. So from a consumer's perspective, it should give a consumer much greater confidence that your crypto is being under custody safer because the key is in different, different, different areas. So that's, the, um, that, that's how it works. And certainly... We think there's a huge consumer demand for this. And what Karen was talking about, in terms of people looking to transact more in crypto and trade more in crypto, this solution should give the population at large sort of greater confidence of wanting to, to participate in the crypto economy. I think this is a, a driver of Right, of yeah, no, I agree completely. Yeah. Confidence is, is obviously essential. And the other one was the ECN. Can we more color on the electronic trading? Uh, yeah. So we've got um, like a whole cross-functional team working in the business to sort of basically bring this offer to the market, as I said, like in the early, early summer. And we'll be making some announcements about that soon, particularly with the, the back ecosystem partners we're working with. So we're working with a couple of, couple of partners to, to do that, which is very, very exciting. Um, but really, it's our move to play bigger in the institutional market. That's essentially why, why we're doing this. And given the spot Bitcoin ETF growth, uh, we think the timing of this is really solid, right? To right. sort of take part, take part in that marketplace. Well, the halving's coming up. And the halving is just a, a way for the Bitcoin world to slowly reduce the number of Bitcoins that are out there. Not reduce, I should say, slow the growth to be appropriate. Um, and I look at it as something that, may, you know, historically the halvings don't have a, a definitive effect on the Bitcoin price, but if nothing else, it brings attention to it. And attention generally brings more people into the world. And then uh, eventually there's only going to be so many Bitcoins. So that's a little ways away, but we are pretty close to that right now. Uh, I think we've got 19 million out. I think the limit is 21 uh, in terms of total Bitcoins that are going to be issued. So to maybe transition just a little bit, you, last quarter, I think uh, you guys talked about the Caesars Rewards Program, which is part of the loyalty, like as Karen was mentioning, a digital asset as well, just a different type. Uh, maybe you could give us an update on what's going on with Caesars. 
Yeah, so um, you might have seen that back we sponsor what's called the Back, back Theater in uh, Vegas, which is part of uh, the Caesars property. And we're working with Caesars to essentially put in the marketplace um, Caesars rewards get flipped into crypto, essentially. So the uh, Caesars customers can then participate in the economy through their engagement with the Caesars, Caesars brand. So that's still in play. Um, it's uh, certainly it's not launched yet, but it's one of the things on our product management list to get that into the market as soon as we. Great. Uh, I also noticed that I think you company backed is at in Paris this week. Mm, yeah, uh, at the blockchain right. event, right? Yes. Uh, so, blockchain being the foundation of, of Bitcoin crypto. Maybe you could kind of give us an idea of what's going on there. Yeah, so we've got a team over there at the uh, Paris blockchain this week. And the goal of her presence there is to really sort of build up her relationships with, with, within our ecosystem with uh, clients and partners, but also um, analysts, which cover the market in Europe as well. And really just to expand her presence in, in the EU and the UK. And, uh, you know, VACT also has a facility in Belfast uh, where we do a lot of engineering and development. So, you know, we've just got to make sure we have that European presence. And you've got to be, you've got to be present to win, right? So yeah, our teams, yeah, yeah, our teams over in Europe this week have been that. Well, the European and UK uh, crypto regulatory environment is much further along, correct, than the US? Yeah, I mean, definitely, I mean, the, the, the US has been a, yeah, it's, it's been a challenging time to be a crypto company. Let's just maybe start with that in terms of the, you know, the skepticism that the SEC has on crypto um, and then the lack of clear roadmap in terms of how crypto should be regulated. Um, so I think when you compare that to what's happening internationally, um, there, you know, the EU, the UK, um, Australia, there's a number of markets that have put forth a much more transparent um, uh, regulatory framework where we've seen an opportunity for us, you know, we, you know, we are a U.S. company. We continue to be excited about the opportunities in the U.S., but a lot of our um, existing customers, our existing clients, actually also offer trading services to internationally. Um, and so our technology is really a great fit where if that company already basically offers equity trading for in U.S. dollars, they could plug in our technology very easily and be able to offer um, uh, crypto. So we're seeing opportunities to expand there. Um, and then certainly you know, that, that trying to get that nice overlap with partners and in, in clients that we know or are developing relationships with in markets where we think it is, um, it's clear and transparent in terms of how we operate. So in terms of... Uh maybe switching horses a little bit here. You recently did a raise, yes. right? Um, congratulations, by the way. It's always hard to raise money. Um, can you give us some color on that. How did that go? Why did you raise the level you raised, et cetera? Yeah, and so it's, yeah, um, I, I'll, I'll give you the short and sweet version. So, you know, obviously one of the reasons why it is, um, you know, good to be a public company is the access to the capital markets. Um, you know, there's cost involved in being a public company, but the access to the capital markets is really a benefit there. Um, we started the process, we were S3 eligible back in April of 2023. Um, we started the process of basically getting our shelves approved by the SEC. Um, again, that, that Venn diagram of being a DSPAC in a crypto company, um, that process took a lot longer than what we had expected, but we ultimately completed that process in um, February. So, um, and we're able to successfully raise $50 million. So. Um, you know, it's great to couldn't you know, or it was it's great to be able to go through and ultimately get through a very um, rigorous vetting process by the SEC. And ICE was a participant in that. Yeah, ICE ICE is about ten million. Is I should say not about. They are ten million of that raise, and then there was a club consortium that um, has the rest. And just as a quick follow on, uh, is ICE an element of the day to day or? Are they really more hands offish? Yeah, I mean, they're certainly hands off. I mean, they've got from ICE. 
right. uh, that gives gives us the connectivity, but certainly, you know, that's the relationship. Yeah, I mean, they, they don't control us anymore, but obviously, in terms of you know where there's op joint opportunities to participate in the space, it's great to have that relationship continue with them. Yeah, I'm getting to say more. We're kind of yep. short on time, so maybe as a, a final question, what do you want investors and the audience here to take away? Today? Yeah, I, mean, I, th I think the yeah. So I think the key messages are, you know, this this market has incredibly strong you know tailwinds. I think we've all seen the recent um, increase in interest in the crypto market, particularly with trades, uh, which are, are going very very well. And when that meets our capability of having this trading and custody platform that we offer our clients, and we are their partners in growth to take advantage of this incredible market opportunity, the confluence of all these things, I think, is just creating a, a very strong and positive environment for all the participants to win here. And that's why investors should have confidence in, in what, we, what we do. Great. Well, thank you both so very much. Thank you. And uh, well, we'll very, thank you very much for your time. Great. Thank you.
It wasn't on. Well, yeah. see, it's not just me. All this For once, I'm not wrong. <laughs> Anyways, let's start again. So crescendo, it trades on the NASDAQ CXDO. And, and Doug here is going to give us a full and in-depth introduction to the company. And we'll follow on with Q&A. So Doug, Thanks, all to you. Really appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. And everybody online, thanks for joining us. Uh, so let me bring up our slide deck here. So uh, really excited to be here at the WTR AI and Technology uh, Investor Conference. AI is really, really transforming what's happening out there in the communications industry. And so, you know, it's a, it's a buzzword that we hear in a lot of different uh, industries and sectors. But uh, from a communication perspective, AI has got a lot of places there. And so we're going to talk about that as we go through the presentation. But uh, let me just queue up our slides here and we'll get started. So safe harbor statement that you've probably seen a number of times today already. So what does Crescendo do? We're a unified communications as a service company. So in layman's terms, we do cloud communications. We do business telephone systems using the Internet. And so a voice over IP company that uh, really has two types of offerings. We have a cloud offering that we sell as a wholesale type uh, function. And we have a cloud offering that we sell to on a retail side to direct businesses. And so when you look at this slide here, you see a lot of company names that uh, you're going to be familiar with. On the wholesale side of the house, we sell a solution that competes against Cisco and Microsoft, uh, two of the largest companies in the world. Cisco bought Broadsoft about five years ago. Broadsoft was the largest platform provider for software services in the unified communication space. And Cisco bought uh, Broadsoft for about $1.2 billion five years ago. Microsoft bought Metaswitch about three years ago. They were the second largest software platform provider out there. And so Crescendo is, uh, is really in a really great spot because we're the third largest platform provider out there. Now, obviously our first two big competitors, uh, Cisco and Microsoft, much larger than we are, but we're doing a really good job of taking market share and growing rapidly. In fact, Frost and Sullivan just uh, pronounced us as the fastest growing UCAS provider in the country back in January. And that's really important because we're outgrowing our competitors. We're outgrowing Cisco and Microsoft at a pace of two to one. So when we look at the amount of rapid growth that we're seeing there, we're seeing tremendous growth while our competitors, although much larger, are seeing a much slower growth there. So we offer our platform as a software solution and we offer it on a wholesale basis. We currently have about 220 licensees that have our platform that use it for their own purposes, branded as their own, and sell it to retail type uh, solutions out there. So that's the largest part of our business uh, from a customer penetration perspective. We currently service over 4 million end users uh, with our platform today. And again, 4 million users making us the third largest platform provider in the country. On the retail side of the house, our solution is selling phone services to small and mid-sized and small enterprise businesses. And on the bottom section there, you can see that there's tens of thousands of companies that, uh, that do the same type functions there. But we're unique in the fact that uh, when we compete against some of the names that you're probably familiar with, the Ring Centrals and the 8x8s and the Vonages of the world, we really have a unique positioning out there because when we go out and we sell a direct end user business out there, we do a lot of hand-holding and our, our claim to fame there is the customer support and service that they get from us because a lot of our competitors went upscale and forgot about how to handle the small and mid-sized customers and that's really where we specialize so when we think about those two segments uh, to give you an idea of how they uh, compare in our organization last year in 2023 we finished with 53 million dollars in revenue and of that $53 million, 35% of it came from the software solution side. That's the platform side of the house. So 35% of our revenue comes from the software solutions, the wholesale side of the house. Currently, as I mentioned, we've got 220 licensees that sell our platform as their own. And those licensees are made up of MSPs and service providers. Um, they're made up of white label providers. They're made up of telephone companies and tech companies. And so when they buy our instance, they put that software solution in their data center, or we can host that software solution for them. And then they brand it and they go out and they sell it to their end users out there. Very sticky customer. Those uh, licensees, when they buy our system, they've built their whole business on our platform. So it's a very sticky customer. And again, almost 4 million users out there using the platform uh, through our licensees out there. 
65% of our total revenue comes from our telecom services side of the house. That's where we're selling the retail side. That's where we're selling direct end user customers out there. And we sell that through two sales forces. We sell that on a direct sales side. We also sell it through a number of agents and resellers out there, about 200 agents and resellers out there that sell our solutions. And those agents and resellers might be copier companies. They might be business to business companies. They might be data bars. And they add our Crescendo solution as one of their offerings out there to go to their customers and sell their customers on having the best communication solutions out there in the industry. So when you look at those numbers there, 65%, about 30, a little bit more than 30 million of that 53 million came from the direct retail side of the house. So how do we win? Again, how do we position our company out there? And as I mentioned, you know, the, the customer service and support is really critical. When you think about how cloud communications differs from the old phone systems of yesteryear, the old phone systems of yesteryear sat in somebody's equipment room in the office. If something broke, a technician drove a vehicle out to try and fix it. Well, with the cloud, everything is on the, on the cloud. So you don't have a technician driving out, driving out to a customer site to fix it. Everything is done remotely. So you've got to do the handholding for the customer because you know if they have an issue, you got to be able to resolve that issue. So our claim to fame out there is really being the best customer support organization out there in the sector. Uh, we just put out a press release last week. We were ranked number one in 19 different categories with G2.com. G2.com is one of the leading uh, site review surveys on the internet. And the nice part about G2.com is it's verified surveys. So they're actually verifying it with customers, real customers, to get the data. And if you look at the uh, statistics up here, really proud of the fact that uh, you know when customers buy a Crescendo system, we take care of them, okay? They know that their whole communication for their business is critically important and we take care of them down to the nth degree. And you see that with the numbers up here compared to our competitors out there. So that's really how we position ourselves out there with customers on taking care of all their needs out there. So let's talk a little bit about dollars and cents, and we'll start talking about the AI and the technology aspect of the business. But if we look at the two different segments of the business, again, the software solution segment is the platform side of the house. So if you look at the platform side of the house, we compete against Cisco and Microsoft there as the third largest provider on the platform side, but we've got a really disruptive pricing model. We sell our solution on sessions, not seats. If you're familiar with Cisco and Microsoft's models out there, on just about everything they sell. They sell everything on a per seat basis, which means that if you've got, uh, just to use a, an easy example, if you've got a telephone company out there and you wanna put our platform in, or you wanna put Cisco's platform in, if you've got 20,000 phones that you wanna support on that platform, with Cisco and Microsoft, you have to buy 20,000 licenses to support those 20,000 phones. Even though a phone might be here in a conference room or a phone in the kitchen or a phone in the lobby that really gets used, you're paying a per seat license for each and every seat. When we came out with our platform, we realized that, hey, we're competing against two of the biggest companies in the world. We've got to have something pretty disruptive. So we came out with a model that said, hey, we're going to sell our solution on sessions, not seats. Sessions means simultaneous conversations. So I could have that same scenario that I just mentioned, 20,000 desktops that I'm supporting out there. But at any given time, maybe only 1,000 of them are on the telephone or 1,500 of them are on the telephone. So we sell a very unique model that's called sessions, not seats. You pay for your usage, not for how many phones you've got out there on the network, but how much usage you're seeing on the system. Very disruptive model, very aggressive model, and we're seeing a lot of traction with licensees from a Cisco or Microsoft moving over to Crescendo because they see a tremendous cost savings there for a system or a platform that's just as robust, if not more robust. In fact, we just put out a press release uh, just about two weeks ago with one of Microsoft's largest platform providers that after about 10 years decided to leave Microsoft, move over to Crescendo. And a lot of it has to do with that customer support, the forward direction of the product, but most importantly, that pricing differential that they'll see from going from a per seat model to a sessions model. So those 220 licensees that we have out there, they bring us about an average of about $5,300 a month. So it's a nice recurring revenue stream about 75% of that revenue is a monthly recurring locked in agreement that uh, they're paying us on. So it's a very, very uh, repetitive uh, recurring revenue stream there. Strong gross margins there. So you're seeing about 69, almost 70% gross margins on the platform side of the house. And you see very little churn because these 220 licensees, when they put that platform in, they've built their whole business 
on our platform. Very difficult for them to leave us. So almost non-existent churn on that side of the house. On the telecom services segment, where we sell direct end user businesses, a little different picture, okay? Because we're selling a small or mid-sized business. And there we're charging per user, okay? So if you look at that, uh, it averages out to about $17 per user per month. Our average account out there is about 20 stations. So, you know, a law firm, an accounting firm, a car dealership, whatever the case might be. So if they've got uh, 20 stations out there, they're paying us about $350 a month for that telephone service. And that's all inclusive for all of their uh, capabilities, all their feature functionality. Again, we sell that through a number of agents and resellers out there, over 200 agents and resellers that sell that solution. And again, a high, high concentration of recurring revenue, 78% of that uh, revenue on a recurring basis. So very sticky customers, but small and mid-sized businesses, you do see a little bit more churn there. So again, churn, one of the lowest in the industry at about 0.79 per month. And at the bottom here, you can see how we're set up for our hosted solutions out there. We host everything in the cloud. We've got uh, multiple sites across the US and a few data centers. Uh, so that's basically how all of these things come together. They come together by contacting the data center and providing all the services uh, through the cloud. So dollar and cents wise, how does Crescendo uh, stack up? What's happening with the dollars and cents? How's the company growing? Tremendous growth in 2023. So 42% uh, total revenue growth in 2023. We finished the year at 53.2 million. Strong, strong year for us. We always talk about our revenue numbers, but then right after that, we talk about our backlog numbers. Because as I mentioned, all of our customers, whether they're on the direct side retail or whether they're on the wholesale side from the platform, um, they sign long-term contracts with us, three or five years typically. So we currently have almost 64 million in, in backlog revenue. And that's an important number because if you look at the bottom left there, you know we started January 1st of 2024 with almost $30 million worth of revenue already contracted and obligated for this year. Strong, strong number. Um, adjusted EBITDA, about 11% to the bottom line. Uh, we were gap profitable in Q3 and Q4. And so we almost hit gap profitability break even for the year. Small gap loss for the year. That gap loss was mainly due to uh, intangible amortization of some of the acquisitions that we've done over the last uh, two to three years. So again, really, really strong numbers there and a lot of nice continued growth within the organization. That 42% uh, revenue, 16% of that uh, revenue growth uh, organically and a couple of uh, uh, percentage points uh, due to the acquisition of one of our licensees that we did and we'll talk about that here in a moment. So how do we keep growing the organization? So we talk about future growth drivers. Again, organic growth is critical for us. Strong organic growth. The two segments on the platform side, 19% organic growth uh, year over year. On the direct side, on the retail side, 9% organic growth year over year. Uh, in organic growth, uh, we expect to do at least one acquisition a year going forward. When we talk about acquisitions, we talk about our stocked fishing pond. We have 220 licensees that use our platform. That's the ideal stock fishing pond for us to do acquisitions and do kind of a roll-up strategy of these licensees. They're part of our community. We've got a great relationship with these uh, licensees. They built their whole platform on our, on our solution. And so when we look at uh, that relationship we have, when we look at doing acquisitions in the future, it's from that stock fishing pond of folks that are already using our platform, running their business very similar to how we run our business. And we're going to talk about one of those acquisitions that we did of one of those licensees uh, just within the last uh, year or so. Globally, if we look at uh, most of our business today, it's international, okay, but uh, I mean, domestic, but if you look at the international market, it's growing tremendously, 74% growth year over year, seeing a tremendous amount of uptick in our international markets, in the European market, in the UK, and in the Pacific Rim. Because the adoption I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, in the U.S., 40 percent of the businesses haven't migrated to the cloud yet. It's even larger numbers over in, uh, in the other uh, countries internationally. So if you look at the European market, about 70 percent of the businesses haven't moved over to the cloud uh, in the international markets. So last year we added 21 new logos on the platform side. Uh, that's tremendous to get to that 220 numbers uh, for licensees. 21 new logos and a lot of those new logos are coming from the Cisco's and the Microsoft's because they're realizing tremendous cost savings, tremendous benefits uh, with our platform. 
So we talked about acquisitions. We did an acquisition in November of uh, 2022. Um, one of our licensees, Allegiant Networks out of uh, Kansas City. So they were already using our platform. Perfect fit for us. Um, great valuation. Uh, they were doing about 10 and a half million in revenue. And we've seen almost a 20% organic growth in that organization since we purchased them. Last year, they finished at about 12.7 million. So a nice organic growth after we bought them by being able to put some of the resources in of a larger publicly held company to allow them to grow their same store sales there. We did that acquisition. Uh, they were doing 10 and a half million in revenue. We bought them for less than one times revenue. And it was a great acquisition, very accretive acquisition because when we acquire these licensees, there's a lot of cost savings that we can see out of that business. So that model is something that we can repeat over and over again. And we're very confident that uh, we'll have another acquisition to announce here before the end of the year. We talked about with the international opportunities and the domestic opportunities, a tremendous amount of growth in the industry. So uh, if you look at where the industry is today, again, it's not a matter of if businesses move to the cloud, it's when. And over the course of the next three or four years, Gartner and Frost and Sullivan's reports all show that uh, those numbers that are 40% here in the U.S. that are not on the cloud yet will get down into the single digits. So there's still a lot of runway in this sector for businesses migrating to the cloud. So as we get into the discussion for today and, and talking about how businesses are making decisions and why technology is driving this, um, if you look at businesses today, the reason is that they're making investments in the cloud is they want to be uh, more efficient. They want to be more productive. They need to have mobility and collaboration and all these tools. And so if you look at this, uh, there's a lot of technology drivers out there that are driving customers to go out there and look at our solutions out there and figure out, hey, how does that fit into, into their business? And a lot of the technologies that we're talking about now used to be outrageously expensive for small companies. You know, we're talking about technologies and contact center, and we're talking about technologies with call recording and call logging that used to be outrageously expensive and only you know, Fortune 100, Fortune 500 type solutions. Now those same capabilities are available to just about any size business out there. And that really leads us into you know, AI and how AI is enhancing what businesses can do out there. Uh, so I'm going to walk you through a quick application on our system to show you how AI is working hand in hand with our communication solutions to show you how the power of AI is impacting customers' communication capabilities uh, within their business. So this is uh, a screenshot of our portal of our system. So if you have a Crescendo system out there, uh, the portal is how you control the system. You go online and you can program the, th the system. You can set up all your feature functionality on the system. So when you go into the portal on the system, you've actually got an AI tool that allows you to uh, have the AI assistant help you build how your system is going to function. So in this case, uh, we would just hit the use AI assistant on the portal there. And then it brings up, hey, tell us about your organization. So for the example up here, I've got uh, fidelity.com. So I put fidelity.com in. And after I put fidelity.com in, here, but uh, the little blue button on the right uh, is go. So I would hit fidelity.com. I hit go. It goes out to the website and it scrapes fidelity.com's website. And then it brings up a litany of options that based on what I just read off the website, hey, here's all the options that we can set up your system with. And so if you look at uh, maybe the third one down, the third one down is saying, hey, here's your auto attendant options for your system. So how about we start with welcome to Fidelity Investments. Please choose from the following options. Press one for investment services, two for retirement planning, three for wealth management. So it's done that in a matter of seconds by just pulling all the options off of the website and saying, hey, this is a logical setup for you. You can go in there and edit it on the right hand side. You can combine a number of these but all of that is just built out automatically for you. And if we jump to the next slide, the next slide says, hey, now that we've set up your auto tenant, what do you want to tell people when they're on hold? You know, call comes in, they put the call on hold. Now we're going to build your on hold messaging. Again, scraping off the website, all the information that I just found about Fidelity, and now I build it out. So again, whether I put in fidelity.com or wtr.com or crescendo.com or your business out there, the system is going out there and building a solution based on how your website's set up. And if your website's current and, and up to date on how your business is operating, this is going to fast track everything for you. Then once I say, hey, we want to use this for our marketing on hold, um, I basically uh, ended up and I'm not sure how I can uh, 
hit the uh, play button there, but uh, I would hit the play button here and it would actually play that announcement for me. Let me hear it. Uh, I can choose. Do I want a, a male voice, a female voice, a European voice, whatever the case might be. So AI helps me build that solution in a matter of moments. Okay. Other AI solutions out there. Um, since AI has become such a mainstream application on our system, our system is a very open system. We have about 240 API integrations on our system today. What that means is that we've got developers out there, some of them in-house, but most of them external developers out there. They're writing code and writing applications that build into our system. So for example, we've got a, a solution out there that uses sentiment analysis with AI to drive how the system operates in certain instances. So what does that mean? Solution for a car dealership is an example. Uh, we put a system in for a car dealership and we've got a sentiment analysis capability that can go in there and say, hey, I'm gonna record all the conversations for the sales department. And so if John is one of my sales reps out there and John's talking to an end user prospect about a vehicle, it's recording the call and using sentiment analysis, it's looking for certain words. And when certain words happen, we program into the system, hey, when you hear these words, trigger this action. So if John's talking to me as a customer and I'm saying, hey, John, I really like this vehicle, but I'm kind of thinking about electric vehicles. And so can you tell me what you have in, in the line of electric vehicles? Well, John may not be the electric vehicle but expert. Maybe Ron's the electric vehicle expert. So when John's talking to me as a prospect and I say something about electric vehicles, the system sees that and through AI, it says, okay, hey, I just heard the word electric vehicle. That must be a call that Ron needs to be on. So while John is talking to me, Ron's getting a notification that, hey, Ron, you need to jump on this call. Somebody's talking about electric vehicles. John needs some assistance. Ron comes onto that call and helps close that opportunity. So that's where AI is leading us. All of these applications being developed by our developers out there to be able to enhance the platform, be able to enhance what the capabilities are. Contact centers are a great example. We've got a lot of contact centers out there. We have a contact center as a service option within our system. And so when contact centers get calls, a lot of those calls are repetitive calls. So when a call comes into a contact center and an agent answers that call, you know, in many cases, you have to wait five or 10 minutes to get a live body. And when you get that live body, the agent says, oh, that's easy, just do this. Okay, so with AI, we've got the capability of using AI and ChatGPT that when a call comes in, the system can start prompting the person with all the questions because I've got my database already built. The person that's answering your questions typically as a live person is just typing into the computer what your, what your problems are and it's pulling up that information. So now with ChatGPT and AI, we do the same thing. A call comes into the contact center, contact center answer, agent answers the call, and answers the question, but guess what? With ChatGPT, we do the same thing. So a lot of great technologies there with AI. So again, continuing the growth with uh, Crescendo, a lot of opportunities for organic sales growth and, and improving the gross margins. Uh, you know, Again, one of the most profitable companies out there in the telecom sector and a clean balance sheet on top of that. Uh, you know, Great uh, cash balance on the, on the company, virtually no debt on the, uh, on the balance sheet. So in summary, uh, why Crescendo? Great growth opportunity, you know, 42% year over year growth to 53 million in 2023. And again, seeing tremendous momentum, 5.7 million uh, in adjusted EBITDA for the year, a little bit over 11% uh, there for the year. Um, that backlog number, big backlog number, and that number continues to grow uh, sequentially year over year. Again, strong cash position, very little debt on the balance sheet. Um, when you look at where we are today, continuing to just execute on the fundamentals. 21 consecutive quarters of non-GAAP profitability, two consecutive quarters of GAAP profitability, strong organic growth. So when we look at the organization today, really ripe to take advantage of the huge opportunity in the telecom sector. So with that, uh, I think I'm done with my time and we can open up to uh, some questions. Yeah, I think we have time for one question right now. Uh, one quick question. Um... I don't want to put you on the spot, but did you guys get guidance for 2024? Uh, we didn't give uh, direct guidance, but uh, we did highlight the fact that we finished last year with uh, 53 million, and we highlighted the fact that we expect double-digit growth uh, going forward. So uh, we're covered by three analysts out there. The three analysts have us, uh, you know, pinpointed at about 58 million in revenue uh, for 2024 going forward. 
All right, Doug, listen, I'm sorry to cut you short, but uh, we are at time. Uh, as mentioned before, there are opportunities to still speak with Doug. If you have any other questions, there he'll be in the room in the front and then available for one-on-one -on -one meetings as well. Thank you very much, Doug. Great. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Hello, our next presentation will be from Bob Powers, Chief Financial Officer, Ocean Powers Technology, Inc., which trades on the NYSC under the symbol OPTT. As a reminder to the uh, in-person attendees, immediately following the presentation, management will be in front of the in the front conference room for a breakout session if you'd like to meet with them there. If you'd like to schedule a one-on-one one -on -one meeting with them, please see the Water Tower desk. Welcome, Bob. Thanks, Tim. Morning, everyone. Um, as Tim mentioned, I'm Bob Powers. I'm the CFO at OPT. Um, and in terms of OPT and who we are, you know, I know we had a lot of presentations this morning already on artificial intelligence. Um, when you think of OPT, think of ocean intelligence and AI factors into that, as I'll get into um, in a minute. Um, there's a wide range of um, platforms that we use to uh, gather that intelligence and that data, uh, which I'll get into. Um, today, we have about 60 employees. Um, we have a headquarters in uh, New Jersey, uh, Monroe Township, New Jersey, about 30 minutes south of the Newark Airport. Um, I'll get into the history of the company um, in a little bit, but we've been around for a long time. Uh, for the bulk of our history, we were primarily an R&D company. Um, and as a result of that R&D, we have a significant IP portfolio, about 68 uh, patents today. Um, and um, uh, we've recently made the transition from that primarily R&D company to a commercial company. Um, and that's what uh, has us really excited about where we are today. We are publicly traded. We're on the NYSC American under the ticker symbol OPTT. Um, so reading from uh, left to right here, this is a, a photo of our uh, facilities where we have two main facilities. Uh, as I mentioned, our headquarters is uh, just across the river in New Jersey. We have about 60,000 square feet. That's our, uh, our main manufacturing center. Um, and also uh, is where our uh, administrative offices are located. Uh, and we also have a facility in Richmond, California, just across the bay from uh, San Francisco, which primarily houses our autonomous vehicles division. Um, and that, uh, that came on board uh, through an acquisition that we did in uh, 2021 of a company called Marine Advanced Robotics. 
Um, this slide I keep in here um, just to give a, a little bit of the history of the company because uh, some of you may be familiar with OPT. We've been around for a long time. I think today we function primarily like a startup, um, but um, in spite of that, we have been around since the 90s. We started on the campus of Princeton University, um, and back then we were primarily a grid-connected wave energy company. So um, we generated uh, sustainable energy through um, the movement of waves, and uh, the goal was to connect that to the grid. I don't spend a lot of time talking about that um, because that's not what we do today. We have uh, pivoted, um, but sometimes at these conferences, uh, I do hear from folks who, who do remember uh, us from way back when. Um, a few years ago, we pivoted to be more of a data company. So we still have uh, the buoys that generate uh, energy but we use that energy for a different purpose. And that purpose is to um, power both hardware and software way out in the ocean and gather data. Um, here's a picture of some of our main products, the products and platforms that we use to gather that data um, that I'm talking about. On the left, you can see what we refer to as our power buoy. Um, so the way that works is you can see the, the collar kind of just above the water there. That collar moves up and down, drives a generator, and um, um, trickle stores energy to a battery located within the buoy uh, that can store about 150 kilowatt hours of energy. And we use that energy to power almost anything that you can think of um, in the ocean um, and um, on a smaller scale, including our WAM Vs. So all the way to the right is our, uh, what we refer to as a WAM V. It's a, an unmanned surface vehicle. You can think of these as drones for the sea. Um, and uh, generally they are electric powder powered. So they have um, batteries attached to them. And I'll show you in a second, the, um, the WAM Vs can recharge on our buoys, um, which is a, a pretty nice solution. Uh, in the middle is the intelligence and the data that I'm talking about. So a lot of our customers are not necessarily um, interested in how we provide the data to them. Um, you know, some are, uh, you know, especially with the, um, the buoys being, um, you know, sustainably uh, energy produced. Um, they are interested in that kind of uh, as an aside, but primarily they're really focused um, on the data, and that's a bit of what you can see um, in the middle there. The little bigger picture of the power buoy, um, so you can get a feel for what it does. These are very large buoys. It's not something that you see um, you know, on, your, on a lake when you're boating. Um, these are about 14 tons, 13 meters tall. You know, the, the bulk of the buoy that you see there is actually sitting below the surface. Um, and that's where the, the guts of uh, the buoy uh, resides. Um, the buoys can provide coverage of about 1,600 square miles um, in the ocean from uh, a communications um, and surveillance standpoint. Um, and as I'll show you uh, in a minute, um, you know, that makes a big difference. You can uh, tether a bunch of buoys together and really cover a very um, large amount of the ocean. Uh, I think the other key thing to highlight here, uh, as a, opposed to some of the um, our competing technologies, these operate 24 hours a day, um, you know, 365 days a year. From uh, an energy generation standpoint, if you're familiar with other sustainable energies like wind or uh, solar, wave energy is much more uh, predictable and much more um, consistent. So obviously with the sun, you know, uh, depending upon you where, where you are, it's not shining 100% uh, of the time. Wind isn't always blowing. Um, for waves, they are, are fairly predictable um, and allow us to power our buoys 24 hours a day. Another picture of our uh, WAMVs. So they come in three different sizes. The first picture I showed was uh, a 22 foot WAMV. Um, the top picture there is eight foot and um, at the bottom is 16 foot. So eight, 16, and 22, depending upon what your needs are. Um, our WAMVs also function 
um, as a payload carrier. So the smaller version, the eight footer, can carry a payload of about 50 pounds, uh, relatively small if you have small needs. Um, it's powered by batteries, as I mentioned. It can last for about 10 hours at a time before it needs to be recharged. Uh, in the middle is our 16 footer. Um, depending upon the battery configuration, you can have a payload of between three and 400 pounds. Um, and again, uh, that'll last for about uh, seven and a half hours before it needs a recharge. And then on the higher end, if you have a higher payload is our 22 footer. Um, that can be powered by both batteries and um, gasoline. Typically we use it um, uh, with, with gasoline um, just because um, you get a little better uh, burst and, and a little better um, endurance from that. So um, we can go out for about 29 hours at a time, um, which makes it. Um, I, I put this slide in here just to show um, how our WAMVs and our, our buoys um, can work together. So, um, you know, as far as I know, um, there's not another company out there that um, is able to offer um, a product line like this, integrating, you know, both um, autonomous and roaming vehicle capability, along with the stationary persistent capability that our power buoys um, can offer. And then, you know, as I mentioned before, that top picture there, you know, you can see if you had, uh, in this picture, there's, you know, five buoys lined up. So if you wanted to guard um, almost your entire uh, water border, um, you know, with those five buoys there, you cover about 8,000 square miles. Um, so that's, that's huge. Um, and the bottom picture is a picture of a Wham V docking with um, our power buoy and charging. So um, it's, uh, it's not dissimilar from what we're seeing with EVs and, and Teslas today, where um, you, know, you, you charge um, at the, the charging stations uh, in your mall parking lot or wherever it happens to be. We're actually a little bit uh, ahead, in my opinion, of where um, the onshore technology is for recharging because we're using wave energy as a renewable source. So, you know, obviously your, your um, electric vehicles uh, onshore are using electricity, but where is that electricity coming from? Uh, in most cases, it's a, a carbon generated source um, where we're using um, just the renewable energy generated by the waves. Um, okay, uh, numbers, uh, I'm a finance guy, so this is uh, one of my favorite slides. So, um, you know, I mentioned that we've been around for quite a while, but the company really has pivoted in the last couple of years. So we have a, an almost brand new uh, management team. Philip Stratman is our CEO. Uh, Philip has a, a lot of uh, experience in uh, both oil and gas and um, uh, the maritime industry. Um, and Philip was tasked with transitioning us from um, uh, what was primarily an R&D company to a commercial company, which is what we are today. Philip hired me uh, about uh, two years ago, um, and together we've put the company on a path to profitability um, and uh, a, a cash flow positive um, basis. Um, we did announce last fall that we expect to be both profitable and cash flow positive sometime during calendar uh, 2025. Um, so this uh, this chart here shows our revenue growth since. The, uh, the new management team took over. Um, I'm especially proud of that, that last bar there all the way to the right. So um, that was just about a month ago. We announced our fiscal Q3 revenue, um, and it was the largest revenue uh, for a quarter in the history of the company. Um, I talked about cash flow, so we are focused on positive cash flow um, in transitioning from what was that R&D company to a commercial company. Um, the pie chart all the way to the left here, you can see um, we did do a bit of a restructuring this past fall where we shifted our headcount from an R&D focused company with a lot of engineers to more of a manufacturing company. Um, so over half of our company today, um, from a headcount perspective, is dedicated to operations and um, vehicle delivery. The other thing that we're excited about is our pipeline. So I mentioned that we've turned over the uh, 
uh, most of the management team in the last couple of years. Um, about two years ago, we brought on Matt Berdini. Matt is our chief commercial officer. Um, so when Matt joined, we had uh, almost no pipeline, I would say. Today, um, and it, it does vary by day, um, but um, we're in the $80 million range. Um, and you can see that it's pretty well split between um, um, customers looking for the power buoy or the WAMV. And we also have a, a nice segment, which I think um, we serve the market better than anybody else uh, in terms of offering a combination. So we do have customers that are looking at both the WAMVs and um, the persistent coverage that you get from a power buoy. Um, also in terms of the pipeline, the other thing that gives us uh, a lot of confidence with where we're going in the future, um, we are um, uh, quite a ways along in discussions with many of our customers. Um, we have a lot of NDAs signed and you can see at the bottom, you know, between the contracts that we have in customer review um, or in final uh, negotiation are uh, over $30 million. Value proposition. Um, so um, I mentioned Philip, uh, our CEO. He has a background in, um, in the Navy. Um, anytime you can decrease a vessel going out into the water and decrease headcount associated with that vessel, you save money. Um, so that's a, it's a big part of our value uh, proposition um, from a cost perspective. On top of that, from a safety perspective, the same thing. Um, anytime you put a, a person out on the water, there's a risk that's associated with that, and we can uh, reduce that, uh, that risk. The other part that um, is very attractive to our customer has to do with the decision making. So our buoys um, can crunch da data on the edge, upload that data to the cloud, and wherever you're sitting, whoever wants to use that data can, um, can uh, access it. Um, from a, a cozy cabin, as we say, or wherever they happen to be. So um, that, uh, that's attracted to our customers as well. We have a, a knock um, ourselves in uh, New Jersey where we're able to monitor uh, all of the buoys as well. And then I mentioned sustainability. Um, again, for me, that's not the, the forward piece of what we do. Um, you know, it's really delivering that data, but our buoys have no heat signature, no sound signature for the most part, um, and obviously they're uh, renewable and sustainable. Um, so that's, uh, that's attractive, um, particularly for our customers that are looking for carbon credits or you know, replacing what they've used historically that is carbon-based with something that we're, um, OPT is able to sell. Uh, this is the team again. Um, I, I mentioned Philip uh, and myself and Matt. Matt came to us from uh, Teledyne, uh, where he was for about 13 years. Um, so um, a lot of experience in the maritime industry. Um, and um, that's been a, a major focus for us for the last year and a half, at least, is building up the sales team and building up that pipeline. So when Matt joined, we probably had one or two salespeople. Um, that's uh, you know, we're in the, the eight or nine uh, range right now, and that's directly leading to uh, the pipeline that I mentioned earlier. Um, some more uh, investment highlights. So uh, again, um, with the numbers, um, you know, our bookings were, were relatively low just a couple of years ago. Um, last year, we did a year-on-year -year 4x to what we had done uh, in the prior year, um, and we're looking to you know, at least double that um, going forward. Um, and, you know, given that $80 million uh, pipeline, we feel pretty confident in that. Um, and then one of my favorite slides here. So, you know, the, the strategy that we've placed um, is working. Um, you know, in, uh, in March, we were able to announce our largest uh, WAMV order ever. Um, for a Latin American customer. Um, and we've only just begun expanding into Latin America really in the last few months or so, and that's really paying off. So, um, you know, there are different parts in the world that we, you know, to date really haven't focused on. We're putting our energy there. We're putting our money there. We have a, a salesperson in Latin America now, um, which is uh, really paying dividends. 
Um, I mentioned last quarter was the largest uh, quarterly revenue um, figure in our company's history. Um, and um, you know, we're, we're looking to see that trend continue. Um, the one item I didn't mention, if, if you follow OPT, you may have seen a press release we put out um, just on Monday about a partnership that we now have with Redcat. So if you're not familiar with Redcat, um, Redcat is a really interesting company. Um, they do aerial drones um, and um, they have a, a great product. They're really known for their night vision on their aerial drones. And, um, you know, which makes a difference, especially in our space where you're looking at security and defense. Um, you know, obviously the, the bad actors that are out there uh, often are uh, doing so under the, the guise of night uh, and they don't let you know uh, what they're doing. So um, it's a, a partnership that we have with Red Cat where um, you can launch their aerial drones from our WAMBs um, and really give full coverage. Um, and, you know, I think that ties in a little bit with something I, I think I neglected to mention earlier um, on the payload piece of our WAMVs. So our WAMVs can be used to launch the aerial drones, like I just mentioned. They can also be used to launch underwater drones as well. Um, and we're working with a number of companies on that. So if you think about it, between the persistent coverage that you get from uh, a power buoy and the roaming capability that you get from a wham v we're really covering the entire space from the seabed floor to the surface all the way up to space um, when you include the the um the satellites that we work with um or at least um as high as the, the drones can go so really excited about that i think uh you know, to my knowledge there's no other company that, that offers um that wide range of uh, services um, and then we also put out a press release last week for what we're calling Maros. Maros is the technology that really ties everything that I've been speaking about this morning together and, um, you know, uses that roaming capability, um, the persistent capability. Um, we actually work with uh, AT&T. We've put out a, a couple of press releases um, uh, about our uh, partnership with AT&T to bring 5G to the sea um, for communications. Um, so, you know, you put all that together, um, you know, if, if uh, a customer is looking for that um, type of service, um, we feel that we have a, a very well-rounded uh, product offering. Um, so, okay, to wrap up, um, so I, I talked about our uh, seasons, man seasons management team. Um, we do have a, a pretty strong balance sheet, um, no debt today. Um, we haven't had uh, much debt in the, the history of the company. Um, so we have a, a fair amount of cash um, with, with no debt to service. Um, and when you combine that with what we're seeing on the customer side and our relatively new business model um, and the strategy that uh, we've put in place over the last couple of years, we're, we're very excited about where we are today. And, and looking forward to a, a good um, fiscal 2025. So our fiscal year runs from May 1st through April 30th. So we're coming up on the end of our FY24 year now. Um, oh, the only other thing I uh, forgot to mention at the bottom there, um, I don't think I'll have time to um, show it today, but um, for the virtual presentation, there is a, a resources tab. Um, and if you click on that link, it will take you to a video of our wham -V in action and um, uh, pulling up to the docking station and recharging um, and then releasing from the docking station that I mentioned. Uh, that was new technology for us. Um, again, something that we're proud of. That video was, was taken uh, last summer just off the coast of New Jersey here. Um, but again, from a... A, uh, a first mover standpoint, uh, I'm not aware of another company that offers something similar. And uh, with that, I'll open it up to questions. Bob, thank you very much. Uh, as Bob just mentioned, we'd like to open the floor up to questions. What are some of the use cases for um, the wham -V and the, the buoys? government, um, surveillance, that kind of thing, or is there... Primarily, so, um, yeah, thank, thank you for the question. Good question. Um, so if, if I 
didn't stress it enough, we are uh, primarily a defense company today. So that pipeline that I mentioned, um, you know, out of that 80 million, probably 70% of that pipeline is government focused. So if you've seen some of the, the press releases that we've put out uh, recently, you know, you often see it'll, it'll be an unnamed entity. You know, we'll, we'll put the dollars in. So that's because we're working either with the government directly or, um, or with um, a, a governmental agency or a subcontractor. Bob, we get a couple questions from the audience around uh, the military sector that you're sure. just speaking about. Sure. One is, are you seeing escalating demand given the escalating ten geopolitical tensions? And then another person's asking, if you can provide some color on the types of requests you are getting from the military sector, and is that demand from the, the military sector something that you can fill yourself, or do you have to partner or acquire uh, to meet the needs? Yeah. Great question. So I'll, I'll take the, the last part, uh, the last part of that question first. So um, the answer is both. So um, we can fulfill on our own. We're actually going through the process uh, right now of getting um, securities clearance for our facility in New Jersey. Um, so we're, we're um, pretty well along there. Um, and we, you know, we hope to have that during calendar um, 24 here. And um, we also work with, um, you know, almost every large um, defense contractor that you can think of uh, as a sub. Um, in terms of the types of questions or, or the requests that we're receiving from the government, um, you know, we've been public about the work that we've been doing with the Navy in Bahrain. So we have a, a WAM V-22 out there um, doing survey and reconnaissance work. Um, and we can also do communications. So um, communications way out um, in the ocean uh, is an issue. So you think about, it's almost like putting a, a cell tower onto one of our buoys way out in the ocean. Is there a third part to that question? Just uh, how you are gonna meet this escalating demand. <laughs> um, you know, that, that's a problem I, uh, I can't wait to have. Uh, honestly, but no. So, so we are um, fully staffed to meet the demand right now. Um, so last fall, we put out um, a release that said, you know, we expected to be cash flow positive, as I mentioned, and uh, profitable in uh, calendar 25. Um, so we are staffed to get there today um, with the headcount that we have, um, Jersey and California. All right, I think we had one more question up here. Uh, yeah, uh, the the sensor arrays that you had on the buoy seemed quite extensive. Um, it, and it seems that this extensibility to much well beyond the, the group of customers, including defense, could be quite big. I mean, when you when you think about just the demand for data in general, I mean, is, is can somebody start to dream a real big dream with OBT, um, you know, for expanding much beyond the, the verticals you got. Hundred percent. I, I dream a real big dream with OPT every day. So, um, but uh, to your to your question, um, absolutely, it, it goes beyond um, defense and the military. Quite frankly, you know, two years ago we weren't necessarily focused on the defense and military. That just happens to be where the money is today, and they're they're willing to spend, but. The applications are are wide. Um, you know, I mentioned that we work in um, primarily in defense, but there's other um, uh, areas that we are focused on uh, as well, including oil and gas and science and research. We have a, a nice IDIQ contract with NOAA. Um, it's about um, twenty-two and a half million dollars. If you're not familiar with an IDIQ, it's basically like a, a master services agreement. Um, but um, we do work with NOAA. Um, we've been working with them for years. The good thing about some of the science and the research work that we do is typically that's, that's recurring work. Um, so those programs tend to get renewed year after year. So we've worked with NOAA for, I don't know, uh, five, six years in a row now. Um, and uh, we expect that con to continue. So absolutely. I, I mean, the way I describe it to people often is, you know, if you can think of, of any use for data in the ocean, we can provide that um, you know, for you. We just happen to be focused on security because that makes sense. And 
you know, um, as a mentioned earlier, given everything that's going on uh, in the world today in, in Yemen, and the Ukraine and Israel, um, we're, we're getting a lot more um, inbound inquiries for defense and security work. All right, Bob, thank you very much for your time today. Okay. Thank you. As mentioned, uh, if you'd like to speak with Bob further, he is available for one-on-one -on -one meetings and he'll be in the front conference room. Uh, we will be taking our lunch break right now. Uh, so we'll, we'll have about 20 minutes to enjoy, and then we'll be back in here for our next uh, fireside chat with Galaxy. Thank you.